Oh. Commissioner, our first witness is Mr Gregory Martin from Clearview. Mr Martin, do you mind standing a moment? Can I ask you first whether uh, you'd prefer to take an oath or make an affirmation? Uh, oath. Yes, swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. The truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Mr Martin, do sit down. Yes, Mr Cheshire. Thank you, Commissioner. So would you give the Commission your full name, please? Uh, Gregory Charles Martin. And you are the Chief Actuary and Risk Officer for the Clearview Group, correct? Correct. And what is your professional address? Uh, level 15, number 20, Bond Street, Sydney. And you are attending here today pursuant to a summons served upon you by the Commission, correct? Correct. Do you have, a, do you have the original of that summons? Um, do you have that? Uh, oh, I beg your pardon, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and I, uh, that's, I think, uh, the original of the summons that you received, is that correct? I believe so. Uh, I... So that's the original of the summons, Mr Martin? Yes. I tend to that, Commissioner. Give it 6.27, the summons to Mr Martin. And Mr Martin, you have uh, prepared statements in response to rubric 6.21 and 6.70, correct? Correct. I tend to those statements in the exhibits, Commissioner. The first of those, uh, the statement in response to rubric 6.21 dated, Mr Cheshire. Uh. Twenty first of August twenty eighteen. Will be exhibit six point two eight. The second of those statements dated twenty seven August twenty eighteen. Will be exhibit 6.29. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, I, I think the witness has not affirmed the content of them, has he? Uh, I think he has not. I'm it not might sure whether as he... well to be begin with that. I'm happy to have him do so. Those statements are the contents of them true to the best of your knowledge, information and belief? Uh, yes, they are. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Mr Martin. Yes, Ms Orr. Mr Martin, you've held the position of Chief Actuary and Risk Officer for the, Clear, for the Clearview Group since 2011 when you joined Clearview. That's correct. Uh, and you worked in the life insurance and wealth management industry um, before that time with a total period of working in that industry of 36 years, you tell us. Uh, that's correct, yes. Uh, and your work has predominantly been in actuarial roles, is that right? Correct, yes. And you've been put forward by Clearview to answer questions in relation to Clearview's life insurance business. That's correct, yes. Uh, what does your role as Chief Actuary for the Clearview Group involve? Um, well, Chief Actuary and Risk Officer. Uh, my role is um, it concerned really around um, financial uh, management of the group, um, actuarial concerns, um, and the you know, broad risk management across the group. So. Um, not quite sure how far you'd like me to go on, on that statement. I just want to understand the difference between your role as Chief Actuary and your role as Chief Risk Officer. Um, there, there is a, an element of overlap between that. As Actuary, my Chief Actuary, I said I'm mostly concerned around uh, the, the broad financial management of, of the group, so uh, product pricing, profitability, capital management um, and um, um, reserving. For the, for the group, although uh, for, in terms of the life company itself, there is an appointed actuary who has specific responsibilities for the actuarial role within the life company. Um, for the risk management function, um, it really goes to a broader oversight of the risk management framework for the group, uh, which goes from the financial advice business across the life company and into the funds management business. Um, everything from um, interest around reinsurance uh, strategies through to operational risk, um, um, strategic risk and such like. So what qualifies you with your actuarial background to be the Chief Risk Officer for Clearview? I have, um, well there's a, there is a significant overlap between those two roles. Mm -hmm. uh, the role of an actuary is very much a risk management role in, the, in its essence anyway. Um, I also have uh, um, qualifications as a certified enterprise risk actuary as well. 
uh, reflecting my uh, time managing risk. It, it, it is a largely a financial type, you know, historically was more financial focused uh, role, but um, it does you know, go into, um, as I said, operational risk and, and as an executive in the, in, in the industry for many years or an actuary in the industry for many years, I do have a level of you know, understanding of all the main risks and uh, how they affect uh, wealth management businesses. Okay. So Clearview's life insurance business is carried out through Clearview Life Assurance Limited, is that right? Correct. Uh, and I'll refer to that entity as Clearview. Um, Clearview commenced its operations in the 70s, is that right? That's as I understand it, yes. And at that time it was known as NRMA Life? I believe that's correct. Uh, and up until 2011, you described Clearview in your witness statement as operating essentially as a captive insurer. Can you explain what you mean by that? Uh, what I meant by that, it was an insurance company, uh, as you said, uh, initially owned by NRMA. NRMA then sold it to uh, MBF Life uh, in, um, in about 2004, I think it was, and then uh, MBF was taken over by Boopa and it it was sort of owned within Bupa. In that, in those roles, it was mainly marketing its products, or I believe, all, only marketing its products to within the within those groups to the members. So within NRMA, it would it would market to members of the NRMA group or NRMA Insurance, which is IAG today. Uh, within the MBF and Bupa groups, it was largely uh, marketing only to members of of MBF or Bupa, um, either uh, over the counter or you know direct marketing pamphlets in their uh, you know, communications to their members or um, in terms of the investment products which are in the life company but aren't the subject of today. Um, they also had uh, financial planners that were in branches of MBF and so they would also do uh, occasionally I believe some life insurance as well but it was mainly direct product. So it was initially part of the NRMA group, mm -hmm. then it was sold to MBF, then MBF. it was sold to Bupa. Bupa took over MBF, yes. yeah. I, I, my apologies, I understand. So MBF became Bupa. Yeah. And then in June 2010, Clearview was acquired from Bupa by a company that's now known as Clearview Wealth. Is that right? Correct. And as part of that acquisition, Clearview entered into a 10-year distribution agreement, an exclusive distribution agreement with Bupa. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And by that agreement, Clearview would provide life insurance products to Bupa members? Correct. And Bupa would refer its members to the Clearview Group uh, financial advisors if they needed financial advice? That's correct. And you tell us in your statement that Clearview's direct life business has undergone considerable change and evolution since that time <coughs> when the business was acquired from Bupa. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, so initially your products were sold uh, via direct mail to the group members, so to Bupa members, is that right? When it was owned by Bupa or before that, yes. Uh, and there was advertising in Bupa magazines? I, I'd have to... I, I'm not an expert <laughs> on the, the full details of it. I, my history, I, I, I was aware of this company before I joined uh, yes. Clearview, but my understanding was largely uh, both you know, brochures in branches yes. over the counter or would be marketed through direct means, including just straight outbound ma uh, mail. Yes. So, yeah. The reference to magazines comes from your witness yeah. statement, yes. from paragraph 12 of your witness statement. So that had been how Clearview had been operating, but then from late 2010, early 2011, Clearview began selling life insurance online and by outbound telephone calls. So was that, did you say 2000 and Late 2010 10. and early 2011 is when you tell us that happened in your witness statement. Um, yes, it was, it was mainly, well, that's when it started the outbound, some outbound telemarketing by the end of 2010. Yep. Um, it was still at that stage, um, I think at the very end of 2010, there might have been the last direct mail that went to Bupa members. Um, there was also initially uh, over-the-counter sales still being done in Bupa branches, which went on for a little while but proved unsuccessful. But the move into selling online and by outbound telephone calls resulted initially in quite modest sales. Is that right? 
Yes, that's correct. And so in mid-2013, Clearview made a decision to redevelop the model uh, into what you describe in your statement as a more substantial and professional direct life insurance business, which included moving um, into non-BUPA customers. Um, yes, that was the intention. And in the course of 2013, as part of this redevelopment of the model, Clearview established a new sales centre uh, and a new sales and marketing team in Parramatta. That's correct. And you tell us that by early 2014, this new sales centre uh, had a material volume of sales. You were starting to have some success, is that right? Um, yes, that was correct. And so Clearview made another decision, which was to expand the direct life business further uh, by investi investing in an outsourced sales centre based in Melbourne called Your Insure. That's correct. Okay. And sales through the Your Insure business were launched in mid-2014? Around, um, I believe it started in August 14. But the Your Insure business soon proved problematic, didn't it? Um, very soon into its life, yes. And what were the problems? Largely economic problems as we saw them at the time. They had um, the model of um, remuneration from the life company was largely a commission based model. Um, and the, the business was experiencing very high um, cancel from inception rates. So that's where people take out a policy and whether they pay a premium or not, they cancel it within three look periods or shortly after and they refunded their money. So it's so in, in essence a non-sale, but obviously uh, takes time and effort. Uh, or otherwise the lapse rates on the policies were unreasonably high in the first um, few months of the policies. Well, I just want to ask you about a few of the things you mentioned there. You said there were very high cancelled from inception rates, which you described as a non-sale. Yes. That's where the customers agreed to buy the policy in the phone call, um, but very shortly after that makes a decision to cancel the policy. Is that right? Yes, I didn't, I didn't mean it necessarily legally that it was a non-sale, yes. but I meant in essence the customer has said yes, issued given bank accounts details, mm -hmm. and either for some reason the premium can't be taken from the bank account for one reason or another, including um, it, there was insufficient funds in the bank account or um, my understanding in retrospect is more often than not the bank account details were just wrong um, and, and or we did there was a premium taken but the customer would ring up and say oh, I don't like the contract I want to cancel it and the money would be uh, re refunded to them and the policy essentially cancelled as if it never existed. So that was happening a lot in the early days of your insurer as was um, you mentioned high policy lapse rates. What's a lapse rate? That's when the customer having paid at least one premium or two uh, either rings up and, oh, sorry, uh, snap to ring, contacts the insurer and says they no longer want the contract and they'd like to discontinue premium rates or um, they just don't pay their premiums uh, from that point forward and the policy then goes into what's called lapse. So the life company tries uh, to encourage the customer or tries to recover the money but if the policy doesn't go on they issue a notice saying if you don't pay within 30 days your policy is cancelled and after 30 days the cover stops. 30 so days or 31 days. Yeah. So why were those two things happening so much? Why were so many customers cancelling after inception of the policy or the policies lapsing? Um, I, I can't tell you at this point, well sorry at that stage I but we, we didn't know why it was happening, it was happening. Um, our guess at the time was they were marketing to um, customers that potentially um, weren't interested in the products um, and, that, and that they were cancelling them uh, and it could well have been um, they were potentially marketing to you know, a demographic that was a, you know, a little bit too low for those products. Uh, in any case, um, from a Clearview perspective, there, you know, there was no money being made on it, um, and I don't mean that. I just mean financially, it, it was you know, not making money. Mm. Um, it was not providing commission to your insurer either, because uh, we clawed back the commission if the policy lapsed, um, and so they weren't covering their costs. Um, Clearview itself was was losing money on the business as well, and so it was a case of, well, fix fix the 
cancel from inception rates or the lapse rates or you know, this is not going to be a viable business. So why was your insure marketing to customers who you've just described as customers who weren't interested in the product? I, I don't know whether, I don't believe they were necessarily or intending to do that at the time, um, but that seemed to be that they were, <coughs> in retrospect, um, where they were uh, getting customers um, or leads were being generated for them from that market. You also referred to the demographic of the customers being too low. What do you mean by that? Um, so maybe just a, a little bit of explanation. From what I understand of the Your Insure business, it was using third parties to generate l interested leads for it. Um, I, a, a number of those uh, lead generations were things like online competitions. Um, they are other... Uh, accessing leads through other means. Um, I, I, my involvement back at those days wasn't detailed to tell you the, the full detail of it, um, but it was you know, outbound, I, some of it was outbound lead generation as well. Um, they generate a lead that was, uh, a warm lead that was meant to be of interest or have, have interest in life insurance that would be passed to your insurer who would then market to that customer. Um, I'm surmising, or we were surmising at the time, that the there was, there was the fact that the policies were being written and then lapsed and a lot of them were not paying more than a few premiums, um, that they may have been marketing or some of those policies or customers were coming from a, a, a demographic within society that perhaps couldn't afford it or having bought it didn't you know, cease to have interest in it very quickly thereafter. Well, your insurer was trying to sell insurance products to people from a lower socio de demographic bracket, wasn't it? Lower than what Clearview's traditional business was, yes. 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 So it was poorer people who were being targeted by your insurer? I'd, I'd emphasise lower, not lowest. It was meant to be uh, customers who could afford the product and would keep the product. After all, there was no point in selling customers who couldn't afford the product or were too poor. That was not the intention. It was not the intention of Clearview or your insurer. You can't build a business on that. Um, it was meant to, um, relative to Clearview's business, uh, other business, its advice business, its main business, which was clearly middle Australia and uh, higher socioeconomic groups, it was meant to go below that to a strata um, below that in the marketplace, it was not meant to go down to the lowest or the particularly low. What I'm saying is though, we were concerned that that may be where it was finding itself. Well, your cancellation from inception rates and your lapse rates showed that it was. It was yes. being sold to people who couldn't afford the product. As we now know, that is true, yes. yes. So Clearview decided to close that business in December 2015. Yes. Only 14 months after it had started? Um, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And by late 2015, you were also having problems with the Parramatta Sales Centre? That's correct. And that business, like your insurer, was also struggling to make a profit? Uh, yes, that's correct. So you say in your statement that in late 2015 and 2016, Clearview made changes to target, in your words, a more preferred mix of customers? Um, yes, that's correct. Well, what did you mean by that? What was the preferred mix of customers that you wanted to target? We were concerned, as with your insure, um, the Clearview business, the, the lead generation that they were using at the time, we were concerned was, was again, attracting customers, potential customers that were uh, lower socioeconomic group than we wanted or we thought would be appropriate. Um, so um, the, the history of those two businesses was, as it, you know, it says in the statement from 2015, 14 to 15, um, and by the end of 2015, the uh, non-Boopa business was cut back to, I, I think, less than 25% of mm -hmm. what it was before, and a number of lead generation um, sources were cut, either discontinued altogether or cut right back. and in, and from what I uh, understood of direct business, they were instructing the lead generation 
sources to try and focus on you know, a higher demographic than what they were before. Okay, so the more preferred mix of customers that you refer to in your statement is customers of a higher socioeconomic <coughs> status. Uh, that's correct, both higher socioeconomic and, and had, had the wherewithal to afford and keep in life insurance products. Okay. Uh, could I ask that you look at a document which is CVW 8 000 000 001 0002. Assists, so I'll give that number again, CVW 8000002. There we have it, Mr Martin. So this is a document produced uh, for the steering committee at Clearview that was responsible for the direct sales of life insurance. You've seen this document before? Uh, yes, I've seen that in the before, yes. And it's entitled State of Play and dated the 16th of February 2015. So we know from that date that it was created while the Your Insure business was still operating. Um, that would be correct. Yes. Now, do you know who wrote this document? Um, I believe it was the head of Clearview Direct. I think that's who it would be. And do you know why it was created? Um, I think we had a committee that was trying to oversee um, the performance of the, uh, the Parramatta business at that time. I, I can't remember without looking at this one whether it also addressed your insure. But yes. Well, let's turn to the next page, 0003 we see the headline macro environment and the author, the head of Clearview Direct, refers to the direct life market maturing and the competitive landscape changing rapidly. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And there's then a reference to the contestable market in low socioeconomic bands being highly saturated, leading to diminished returns. You see that? Yes. And then if we move to the following page, 0004. I, that, that wording of low, I, it's possibly lazy wording. I think it probably should have said lower, but anyway. Why are you concerned to make that distinction between low and lower, Mr Martin? Um, just because I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that it was meant, I'm just saying it's not meant to be the bottom end of the socioeconomic band because, as I said to you before, that wouldn't have been sensible place to be um, marketing. I just meant that it should have Where was it then? Towards the bottom? Um, no, the below the <coughs> below the mid market, so lower, that's all. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted you. That's all right. We'll just go back to that page for a minute, triple zero two. So the the line that you're referring to is contestable market in low socioeconomic bands. Mm. You want us to read that in as contestable market in lower socioeconomic bands. Oh, sorry, yes, all I was meaning, yes, that's all. I see. All right, if we move to 0004, we see under this slide direct lay of the land that the strategy is to quarantine the low cost operating model space for your insure and move the Clearview brand into the mid market space <coughs> to take advantage of market trends. Yes. Okay, so the your insure business targeted sales to people in a lower socioeconomic bracket and after it was shut down at the end of this year, Clearview 
um, move to focusing on the mid market. Is that right? Um, that was the intention. Yes. yes, all right. Could I tender this document, Commissioner? Clearview Direct Steering Committee State of Play, 16 February 15, CBW 8000, treble 01, treble 02, exhibit 6.30. You, you say, Mr Martin, that that was the intention, um, changing the model to target the middle income uh, market rather than the low or lower socioeconomic um, bracket. It, it, it wasn't quick or easy for Clearview to do that, was it? Um, no, no, was it? Uh, can I take you to another document, which is CVW 5000 0050190? Now, this is a direct target operating model strategy and plan produced for a meeting of the board in the middle of 2016. Uh, yes, I, was that attached to a managing director's report or something, is that right? Yes, this, yep. is, this appears to be, as you can see from the title, an annexure to a report for the yep. board meeting. You've seen this document before? Yes, I have. Uh, and if we turn to 0191, we see that this paper contained a proposed approach as at June 2016 to layering up the business. You see that? Uh, yes. And we learn more about that if we go to the next page, 0192, which is headed pivoting to mid-market and we see that the operating models that are proposed in the paper are designed to accommodate the needs of mass affluent customers. You see that? Sorry, I'm just trying to find... The first dot point. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and so for the existing general advice business, um, which was telephone sales, this is a fundamental shift from the heavily saturated low socioeconomic bands to middle income family segments. Uh, yes. And you see below that the last stop point, we are proactively moving into this territory ahead of expected regulatory scrutiny of traditional direct products and sales practices. What was that expected regulatory scrutiny? Oh, I think it was um, at the time if I'm right, I think ASIC was already um, making comments, negative comments around things like funeral cover. Um, not that Clearview did a lot of that, that business, um, but it was things like that. They were expressing concern around, um, um, I, I believe, um, issues around um, pre-existing, ex ex uh, pre-existing, uh, sorry, pre-existing exclusion uh, conditions and all sorts of things. It was just a, a feeling that the market was gathering more regulatory scrutiny. Mm. Um, the experience of the business, as we said, you know, our, our experience at the time was we were experiencing quite high cancellation from inception rates, quite high lapse rates. Um, you know, whether or not there's anything untoward in the way it was delivered, it was clearly not uh, products that were, um, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not products that were wanted by the people you were selling them to? The nature of life insurance is meant to be a long-term you know, uh, contract where people hold it for a, a sustainable period to meet their, their risk management needs. The fact that these products, oftentimes in the first year across the industry, had lapse rates over 20% in the first year, says one way or another it's not really meeting its, its need. So it was a, a broad philosophical issue that said this, this industry just doesn't feel like one we wanted to be in or or, um, or we thought that there would be increasing scrutiny of. Hmm. The regulator's coming. That's what we see from this last dot point. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So if we turn then to 0193, uh, the next page, we see at the second dot point that the shift in the model, in the Clearview model, involved a refocusing of the existing general advice business from a high volume, low value to a lower volume, higher value business model. Uh, yes. 
and there's a reference there to Appendix A called Quality Over Quantity. Can I take you to Appendix A, uh, which is at 0212? This is a diagrammatic representation of the new general advice model. And we see that the top row is a description of the current model and the bottom row is a description of the new model that Clearview was going to attempt to develop. And the analysis is divided into four topics, customer and marketing, product, sales and distribution and service and retention. And could I ask you to look at the comparison between the current model and the new model, firstly for customer and marketing. We see there that the current model, low socioeconomic demographic segments, and further down, low cost per prospect, low sales efficiency, emotional pitch. What did that mean? What was the emotional pitch? My understanding of the industry as it was, well, it was, spect still is, um, the nature of, of a lot of these sales, whether they're from tele uh, television advertising or outbound telemarketing, is fairly short period of time. Uh, as I meant, the sale is a very short um, uh, process. Um, and the products tend to be um, um, bought more on um, emotional type reaction rather than necessarily detailed thinking of what exactly the product might be over, over the life of the contract. All right, so the current model involved attempting to sell your life insurance products to, I would say poor, you would say poorer people, um, and attempting to sell by making an emotional pitch to them about their need for life insurance. There was definitely elements of that in there. That's well, that's correct. what this yes. document records correct. your current model as being. And the model that you were looking to create on the bottom row, um, the new model, a higher socioeconomic demographic or segment, a higher cost to prospect, higher sales efficiency, emotional and rational pitch. See that? Yes. So you're going to move to a model where you were selling to um, more affluent people and not just preying on their emotions, also appealing to them about the logic of acquiring a life insurance product. Is that right? Yes. Why a different sales approach to poorer people to wealthier people? I don't... Well, I, I don't know that that was meant to be mutually exclusive. It was a, a, a um, an overall... Uh, proposition that we wanted to move away from when, when it refers to low value here, low low premium amounts, products that can't carry um, a lot of uh, cost in terms of detailed um, sales processes or um, whatever with the customer, to a product where you could in, a product that had higher premiums and allowed the company to invest more time and effort into the sales process to make sure customers thoroughly understood their product. I, what we were trying to do here, um, and these are the words of the head of direct, um, hmm. uh, the way he's described it, um, Clearview's main business is in the advice space. Our, our principal customers are ones that have full personal advice who understand exactly what they're buying and, and why they keep, why they want it and they keep it for a long time, even if they don't necessarily keep it with Clearview, they might go to another life insurer over time, but they understand what it is they've, they've got and they've had it thoroughly explained to them. Um, That's not what, what this document is no, about, know, though, is it, Mr no, Martin? No, this no, is about saying, your direct sales model. And, but what I'm saying is the intention of this change in sales model was to try and move a direct model more into that type of approach was to get customers and you know, properly explain to them what they're, why they're doing it and not... Um, simple outbound telephone sales, which mm -hmm. are, I was saying, trying to say before, very short, very brief, have emotion as part of that. So, um, 
so a move from brief sales calls made um, with an, uh, an emotional pitch to poor or poorer people to a model that involved longer sales calls where, in your words, you wanted to ensure that the customers thoroughly understood the product to more affluent people? Um, well, people, yes, who could afford a bigger premium to could cover the costs of all doing that, yes. So I see. So if we turn to the product um, part of this document and compare the current model with the model you were um, trying to develop, we see that the current model was a direct one to six product, non-competitive, limited value, above market pricing. No income protection, trauma, TPD sold, low quality, regulator scrutinised GA products. GA is generally uh, general acceptance, is that right? Um, I think that would be guaranteed acceptance. Guaranteed acceptance, so That would be things you. like funeral products, yes. So the existing model pitched to poor or poorer people, products that were not competitive, had limited value, were being priced above market value and were of low quality and about to be scrutinised by the regulator. I would probably disagree personally with that, that top uh, comment about them being um, uncompetitive and um, above market price. Clearview's pr I, I, this I, was written by the head of direct sales at Clearview? I, I think that was meant to contrast with the proposed at the bottom, which were meant to be higher value products yes. for customers. I, I don't think in absolute terms in the direct market our products were expensive at all and we had, I had seen market research from reputable firms to say that. So I think that was only meant to be relative to the value of the products. You think um, that's what the language of non-competitive means? I, I can't. I, I'm, I'm just saying to you that would be my assessment of the products um, at the time. Um, right. Well, that was the existing product and the product that you were proposing to sell to the higher socio-economic demographic was a top-end professional product suite complete with income protection, trauma, TPD and highly sought benefits. And this time there was going to be market parity pricing uh, and no guaranteed acceptance products. Guaranteed acceptance products are products that don't require the customer to go through a whole lot of underwriting questions to um, get approval to buy the product. They're guaranteed um, to be accepted by the customer because they're a simpler, more generic product. Is that right? Um, yeah, they're designed to be able to be accepted over the phone very quickly um, and they're priced accordingly um, because that means that some customers will take the products who you know, are in different health or something like that. Yeah. So seeing that this document records that the new product was going to have market parity pricing, do you maintain your view that the reference to non-competitive for the current model means something other than non-competitive in the market when compared to other insurers' products? I, I believe the market parity uh, comment was meant to be market parity with advised products that were fully underwritten. So what the, what the strategy was was to essentially take what was uh, or is um, Clearview's premier advice product, which is very market competitive. It is, it is cheaper um, than a common uh, or typical direct market products. They're heavily underwritten. Um, and it was meant to say that these products would actually be competitive with, that, with the retail uh, market. Which product? The new product so that you new, were going to new, sell to affluent people? Yeah, yeah, the new product. So, yeah, direct products are, are usually more expensive than the retail products in the marketplace, partly because they have things like guaranteed acceptance. They're more expensive, but they're of a lesser value, aren't they? They're inferior products. That's what this document tells us. They're of limited value compared to the top-end professional product suite I, I would agree they were of lesser value because they charge more premium per unit of insurance <laughs> value you actually got, or the loss ratio on direct products is usually lower than it is on retail products, yes. So the poorer people that you were telephoning were paying more money for a product of lesser value 
then the more affluent people you were planning to target with superior products for a cheaper price. Um, in terms of loss ratios, that's true, but it's, I, if I could just qualify that, it, it is similar to um, most, most products in the market. If you buy uh, a larger amount of something, you, you would usually get it at a better price simply because the, the supplier can uh, cover their overheads and all the rest of it at a lower, lower unit price. I mean, if you had a term deposit and you have a half a million dollars, you will oftentimes get a better rate than if you have $10,000. There is an element of these products for the, the um, professional uh, retail products. The average premium is much, much larger and this, uh, the ability of the insurer to offer or provide uh, a lower price is, is, is better. Do you think the community would expect that the life insurance products that you sell to them in outbound telephone sales will not be more expensive and of lower value uh, than the products that you are selling to uh, affluent people through other channels? I would imagine most members of the public would, would not understand that terribly well. Yeah. Would they be disappointed to learn that, wouldn't they? I'm sure they would, yes. Mm -hmm. We see from this document as well that in the comparison of your current model with the model that you were proposing to develop in the sales and distribution column, the current model is higher volume, lower value, higher lapse, and the new model, lower volume, higher value, lower lapse. So that was the plan, to move towards this sort of model. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. Okay. I tender this document, Commissioner. Direct target operating model strategy slash plan, June 16, CVW 5000, 0050190, exhibit 6.31. Despite that being the plan, you tell us in your statement that by late 2016 and early 2017, it became apparent to Clearview that the direct life business was unlikely to be able to achieve financial viability. Um, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And you say that this, together with then identified past sales and compliance issues with the business, resulted in a decision to cease direct life outbound sales operations from the 1st of May last year. That's correct. So you emphasise in your statement that the two key concerns were financial viability and compliance concerns. Um, yes, they went together. Yes. Okay. And I show you another document, which is CVW 8000003-1696. This is a document prepared prior to the close of the direct sales business. Uh, and it's a document that suggested that the direct sales business be closed down. Have you seen this document before? Um, I, I think I know this one. It's. Um if I see the first or second page, I'm sure yes. I'll recognise it. Well, perhaps if I could show you 1697, which is the first page, we can see that this document records under the heading The Situation that the direct business is uh, generally poor value for the customer. Do not call register keeps expanding, reducing the available market real disposable incomes under pressure, particularly in the middle to lower socioeconomic demographic. <coughs> Customers are reassessing and learning or encouraged to shop, shopping cover leading to churn. Outbound telemarketing is passing its use by date, declining sales rates, heightened regulatory scrutiny and expectations, pressures on sales approach. So this was the assessment made by the author of this document as to the situation at this time, which led to a recommendation to cease direct sales of life insurance at Clearview. Yes, we didn't want to be in the market anymore. Okay. And you accept that these were, uh, this is a, an accurate assessment of the situation with the sale of direct life insurance by Clearview at this time? Um, yes, I do. All right. I tender that document, Commissioner. Review direct business, the situation, the options and recommendations, CVW 8000 003 1696, Exhibit 6.32. Now, for the period that Clearview 
was selling through direct channels, it sold a range of life insurance products, didn't it? Uh, yes. They included life cover? Yes. Uh, trauma cover? And very small volumes, yes. Funeral cover? Yes. Uh, accidental death cover? Yes. Can you explain what that is? Um, that's a policy that pays on the death of somebody um, when it's due to an accident and not um, causes that are non-accident related. So somebody who gets a cancer or a heart attack won't get paid out. If you have a car accident and die in a car accident, you would. So a car accident is an example of a situation where you could claim on an um, accidental death policy. Can you think of any others? Oh, yes, <laughs> falling off the roof or a mm. uh, skiing accident or all sorts of things, yes. Okay. Now, uh, accidental death is a guaranteed acceptance product? Um, it, in the direct market, it is typically issued as on that basis, yes, a guaranteed acceptance. I, generally speaking, across the market, well, it's, it's whether you call it guaranteed acceptance, it's non-medically underwritten written mm. typically. Um, sometimes, particularly in the uh, retail space, if someone's got very hazardous occupation or uh, involved in dangerous activities, they, they may not be able to get it simply because that's a, a very high risk or might come with a loading or something, yes. But you were selling it in your direct channel uh, and it was a guaranteed acceptance product in the sense that the customer didn't have to answer a set of medical questions over the phone. They were guaranteed to be accepted if they wanted accidental death cover, weren't they? Yes, that's, that's correct. Which is very different to life cover, a traditional life insurance product where you need to go through an underwriting process which involves answering a series of questions including medical and health questions. That, yes, that's correct. Right. Um, funeral is an exception in that, in that category, though. In what way? Well, funeral cover covers you for any cause of death, um, but is typically not underwritten. It's a guaranteed acceptance. Yes. Um, it usually has an accident-only period at the beginning to... So th I'm just saying it's not black and white. Yes, yeah. I understand. I'm talking about a term life yes, yes. cover yes, as opposed to an accidental death cover because both of them are designed to deal with um, or provide a benefit in the case of the death of the person. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, so you had an accidental death policy. Uh, you also had something called an injury cash product. Can you explain yes. what that was? Um, again, that was an injury uh, injury based or an accident based product. Um, like the accidental death, it was a guaranteed issue product or non-underwritten product. Um, from memory, the product provided for uh, a lump sum payable on accidental death. I think the two versions of it was $100,000 or a $200,000 uh, payment. Um, it provided uh, payouts on accidental total and permanent disablement. Uh, I think typically half the sum insured. It provided benefits on um, various significant broken bones. Um, I think it was $10,000 for <coughs> things like broken legs and things like that. Um, product I, it stages, I think, also covered severe burns and other ac accidents. Um, and it also provided uh, benefits that if you were uh, hospitalised or been confined to bed and under a, the care of a registered nurse or, or such like, essentially hospital. Um, it would provide a daily benefit while you were in that uh, in hospital if you had to be there for more than three days. And it was accident based again, so that you only purely, qualified for yeah. cover if the source of your injury or death was an accident? That's correct. Right. Now, all of those products were sold over the phone on the basis of a general advice model? That's correct. Uh, now, today, the Clearview Group operates an advised uh, retail life insurance business as well as an advised uh, wealth management business and a financial advice business. Um, yes, it provides advice based product, products for the advice industry on life insurance and wealth, that's right, and has so an advice business. The direct sales have stopped, um, but you continue to offer the same sorts of products. You still have eight, a species of each of those types of products that you sell, is that right? Life cover, trauma cover, funeral cover, accidental death cover, and an injury cash or accidental injury product? Um, no, we don't offer injury cash or funeral. That's, that all okay. ceased with the direct products. So injury cash and funeral are no longer sold? No. 
but life cover is sold. Yes. Trauma cover is sold. Yes. Accidental death cover is sold. Yes. Okay. And they're sold now, um, branded as part of the Life Solutions product range. Is that right? Um, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and accidental death cover um, has historically been a, a very profitable product for Clearview, hasn't it? Um, define profitable, if you well, mean, well, as I in mean, low cl claims rate? Yes, the, the claims ratio has been very low, hasn't it? Meaning that for each dollar you earn in premium income, the amount that's leaving uh, Clearview as claims pay out is very small. Um, in terms of claims ratio, I agree with you. It is a lower lower ratio. It's not as low as some that I'm aware of. Um, it's the, the premiums on those products, however, are typically uh, much lower than equivalent full cover as well. So in things like just the cost of administration does absorb more of the premium than, than a full cover product would. So that does, I'm just saying it doesn't mean we necessarily, that Clearview itself makes more money out of it. It can be that you, we incur more, we spend more of the premium just administering the contract. Um, you, you, uh, you get to hold on to quite a lot of the money that you bring in for the accidental death policy, don't you? You don't lose much of it by paying out claims. No, but we do have to, we do have to meet our administration costs and we do have to recover the acquisition costs mm -hmm. up front as well. And what mm -hmm. I'm saying is for accidental products, they tend to be much smaller premiums mm -hmm. and the acquisition costs and the costs of administering the contract tend to absorb more of the premium. Well, so what's left over for Clearview for profit is not necessarily different than for a full cover, that's all. There's a lot left to absorb those administration costs, isn't there, Mr Martin? Do you, do you know what the ratio of claims paid out to premiums collected over the last five years has been for your accidental death product? Um, I think from the statement it was 26%, is mm -hmm. that correct? Yep. Yes. So that means that Clearview gets to retain roughly three quarters of the money that it makes in premiums from selling the products with only a quarter of that money um, going out in payment of claims. That's been the experience over the last five years, that's correct. Well, and in some of those years, it's, the difference is even starker. You tell us in your statement that in 2014, the ratio of claims paid out to premiums collected was 1%. Um, yes. There was another year, I think it was 87 or something. It's a very small portfolio. It's, and it's because no one makes claims under the product, isn't it, Mr Martin? The claims numbers are very, very small compared to the number of policies for accidental death that you sell. The, the claims numbers are low, that's correct. Mm -hmm. You tell us in your statement that since October last year, Clearview's practice in its advisor sales channel has been to always offer an accidental death policy to a customer who has a declined application for life cover on the basis of medical reasons. That's correct. So um, the advisors are to attempt to sell someone who doesn't meet the medical underwriting cover for life insurance. They're to attempt to sell them an accidental death policy, aren't they? Um. We, we offer it just to remind advisors the option is there um, for them to consider. But we are talking about people who have been declined life insurance cover and therefore have no option to, to have any cover. So we, we, we offer accidental death as, as, as something they might be able to have. Do, do you think you're doing a service to the customer by doing that? That is the intention. It was, the intention is not... To, to do other than, um, as the process I think in the in the paper says, um, the underwriters do their best to try and offer terms to a, to a client, and it's only when we get to the point of having to say, we're sorry, we can't offer you terms that we, as part of the decline letter, tell the client that there is an accident only option for them. So you um, proceed to offer them a cheaper, inferior product than the one that they applied for, because it is that, isn't it? It's a cheaper, more inferior product to term life cover. No, I don't accept that. Why is that? Well, um, the loss ratio you quoted before uh, was dominated by 
uh, accident only business that was written, um, I think more than half of that business was written under the pre-2010 you know, NRMA and, and Booper days. Um, I think a, a large chunk of the other, other part of the business is, um, uh, was written as through the direct channel and only a small part of it is actually the accidental death that's been written under the life solutions. Um, what, what, I, I, I'm, I'm saying the 26 percent. Well, the 26 percent was an average claims rate across yes. those three. And all I'm saying is, I I can't tell you sitting here, in the witness box, what the expected payout ratio is on the Life Solutions accidental death product. Okay. I'd, I'd have to research that for you. I don't believe it is um, meant to be pathetic at all. It was meant to be a genuine uh, insurance contract. But you know from the terms of the products that the circumstances in which you can make a claim upon death under an accidental death policy are very different to and much more confined than the circumstances in which you could make a claim under a life insurance policy. Absolutely. Yes. And the premium is a fraction of the premium. Yes. So why do you resist my characterisation of it as a cheaper, inferior product? Well. If, you, you, if you're saying that pro, the premium is cheaper, I totally agree. Yes. I, sorry, I thought you were, were meaning that the, the the value of the product relative to the premium was inferior, and I'm no, saying I, I, I didn't mean. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood the question. I mean, when a when a customer comes um, to one of your advisors asking for life insurance, mm -hmm. and they don't get life insurance because of medical reasons, which mean that they fail the underwriting uh, underwriting criteria. Um, the advisors then attempt to sell them an inferior product to life cover for a cheaper premium. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and that's a practice that is often referred to as a downgrading sales practice. Have you heard that term before? That's a term I'm familiar with in the direct market space. I wouldn't characterise this as downgrading. Why not? Um, I've my understanding of where I've heard that phrase in, in the direct space is if a sale becomes difficult, not, not impossible, um, a sales agent may offer a direct as an alternative to achieve a sale. Whereas I think what we're trying to do is for a customer who, who genuinely can't get cover, offer them something else, an option. But you're still trying to achieve a sale, aren't you? Yes, we are, yes. yes. Um, I want to play you a short extract, uh, or an excerpt from a recorded Clearview sales call. This is one of six sales calls made in 2015 that the Commission identified for Clearview last week. Mm -hmm. You've been provided with the recordings of each of those calls. Yes. And you've been provided with the transcripts for each of those calls. Um, yes. And those six calls were part of a batch of 42 sales calls uh, that ASIC obtained from Clearview in 2016? That's correct. Um, now, uh, I want to play you an extract um, to demonstrate uh, downgrading sales practices in the direct sales channel in action. Uh, could I ask that we play audio recording ASIC 0069-0001-0167C and could we display at the same time on the screen the part of the transcript which is ASIC 0069-0001-0439E at 0445-0447. I just want a life insurance, you know. Okay, we, uh, life insurance. Okay, well, uh, at the moment, because you've had the problem with the heart, we, we couldn't give you life insurance. We can give you accidental death insurance. So if you pass away in an accident, we pay money to your family, $60,000 to your family. Okay. For, for whatever they want, okay? Uh, you can do that one. Um, we also have the one uh, that helps protect you at the same time. So we have another one. It's called an injury cash policy, okay? Now, what it includes, okay? It includes $110,000 for your family, ac accidental death, okay? Uh, and everything else is living benefits. So, do you, are you working at the moment, love? 
I'm still working at the moment, but I don't know for how long. It's like, um, and I'm sort of like don't know for how long that I... What do, you do, what do you do for work? I'm still cleaning. Cleaning, okay. Look, listen to this. We've got something called injury cash, okay? Now, it'll cover you for debt, accidental debt, $110,000. Now, if you get injured and you can never work again, whether you're at home, at work, anywhere you are in the world, you get injured and you cannot work again, we will pay you $55,000 when you're alive. We pay to you $55,000, okay? Right. Then we have for accidental burns as well. If you burn yourself, serious burn, we pay you $55,000, okay? Mm -hmm. Then we have loss of limb, sight, speech or hearing. So any accident that results, injury as results in an accident, you lose sight, speech or hearing, even losing the use of a hand or a foot, we will pay you $27,500, okay? Then the main ones, with the broken bones and the fracture. You break or fracture, you got $11,000, we fracture your jaw, arm, leg, even an ankle. However, some broken bones aren't covered, but the full details are in the PDS. For broken bones or fractures, it's $11,000 we pay you, okay? And we also offer you $220 a day if you can find a bed due to an accident, 24 hours a day for three consecutive days under the regular care of a registered nurse or personal care attendant, so you can be a hospital or at home, we pay you from day one, $220 every day, okay? And we pay for 90 days. If you go overseas, and it happens overseas an accident, overseas daily bed confinement benefit is $440, $440 a day. We pay that for seven days, okay? For all that, it only costs you about $11 a week for all of this, including the $110,000. Wow. Yeah, $11. Wow. And that's, yeah, exactly right. And that's accidental <laughs> death, like I said, 110000 everything covered, love. Okay, because at the moment you said you had heart problems, life insurance, I'll tell you now, people have to get life insurance usually when they're young, when they're healthy, because after when you get older or something happens to you, you know, medical condition, usually you are ineligible to receive life insurance. But like I said, the backup option, you could either do the funeral, like I said, you don't want to do a funeral, that's fine, or you could do the injury cash like this one, has the accidental death included, plus all the other benefits that will get paid to you when you're alive if something happens. So there What's you go. All right, so uh, Mr Martin, that was a customer who wasn't able to take out life cover because of a pre-existing heart condition? Um, yes. Yes, and we heard the sales agent move on to trying to sell that customer an accidental death policy instead. Um, accidental death and then injury cash, yes. yes. Now, Commissioner, could I tender the recording and the transcript? Exhibit 6.33 will be the recording uh, of a uh, sales conversation uh, ASIC 0069 0001 0167C. Exhibit 6.34 will be the transcript of the uh, recording Exhibit 6.33 ASIC 0069 0001 0439E. Commissioner Mayor, just raise a question about that. I don't, the version I have doesn't have an E on the end, and I don't know whether that's of any significance. And if it may then be, this may then be my next question, which is, as I understand it, that the E is intended to just be an extract that is being tendered. I, I could clarify. I, I wish to tender the entire transcript. The E was to assist law and order with locating the relevant part of the transcript and the part that we played. Thank you. I'm grateful. I'm content with that. Yes. Uh, now, Mr Martin, have you read the report recently released by ASIC dealing with the sale of direct life insurance? I've read the executive summary. Unfortunately, I've been fairly busy the last week preparing for today. <laughs> You knew that we were going to ask you questions about Clearview's direct sales of life insurance? Yes. So you've only read the executive summary of ASIC's report on that topic? That's correct. Okay. Uh, are you aware from that executive summary that ASIC expressed very strong concerns about downgrading conduct in connection with the sale of accidental death policies? Yes, I am. Um, and ASIC said that there were limited circumstances where downgrading cover might be appropriate but they observed that downgrading could result in consumers buying cover that does not meet their needs and that they do not understand. Yes, I've 
Yes, I understand that, yes. And ASIC also took the view that more generally, accidental death policies offer a very limited benefit to consumers who are ineligible for other types of life insurance. Are you aware of that? Um, yes, I'm aware of ASIC expressing that view. Are you aware that ASIC said that unless firms can demonstrate that accidental death insurance can provide a benefit to consumers, um, ASIC expects them to stop selling the product? Yes, I'm aware that's ASIC's view. So does Clearview intend to cease selling accidental death insurance? Well, we have ceased the products that were sold through direct, so they are that, that product, that version of the product, mm -hmm. is no longer on offer. Um, we will have to think or well, review exactly what ASIC has said about the direct, uh, sorry, the accidental life uh, for the advised products to see whether the same concerns apply. Um, well, the, the, the concerns of ASIC were not just concerns about sales practices in the direct sales channel. Um, they were concerns about the value of accidental death policies to consumers. And as I indicated to you, they formed the view that um, they provide very limited benefits to consumers. However, they are sold through an advisor channel or through a direct sales channel. Well, again, I have to understand when, when ASIC says value, do they mean return in the dollar? Because that is typically my understanding of direct products, they were very poor value for money in the sense of um, the amount of money that the consumers got back in terms of insurance cover was very poor for the dollar they paid for the products. Um, and as we heard there, I, I don't, you know, I don't like that at all, that, that call recording. I just think the, um, what we're talking about though for the advice product is, is a different scenario. And it would come down to, to my mind whether, um, uh, the, the product is, is, is value in the sense of whether what people pay for it, whether the cover they get was reasonable for it. If in the end ASIC and the parliament decide it's not suitable, I suppose we withdraw the product, but then that will mean for people who can't get cover because of medical conditions, um, uh, you saying they can't have any cover, I suppose. that's. It's not just a matter for Parliament, is well, it, I'm Mr not Martin? Saying... You've, you've made changes within Clearview to your model for selling life insurance a number of times already, quite significant changes. I'm asking you whether, in light of ASIC's report about the lack of value for consumers of accidental death products, you intend to continue selling those products? Clearview hasn't made a decision on that at this stage. That's all, all I can say. Um, we will have to review it. Absolutely, um, and try and understand whether you know exactly what ASIC means by that. Well, how do you propose to demonstrate, as ASIC requires, that accidental death cover is a product that can provide a benefit to customers? How do we? How do you propose to demonstrate that? because ASIC said that unless firms can demonstrate that accidental death insurance can provide a benefit to customers, we expect them to stop selling. Well, I would take, sorry, I, I'd go back to whether the amount of claims you're paying relative to the premium being collected is, is reasonable or not. But Clearview is not trying to do something that society doesn't want. So if, if the answer is the answer that, that ASIC and society would li like us to stop offering it, I believe you will stop offering it. It's, it's not a problem with that. Well, that report has been out for a couple of weeks. I assume it's a report that's been the subject of some detailed consideration within your business. I, I, sorry, I've been um, absorbed in the last week with just preparing for the day, Ms Hall, so I haven't been able to talk to other people about it. Well, the two are not mutually exclusive, are they, Mr Martin? You've been preparing to come and speak to us about these very topics. I appreciate that, yes. But you're unable to say anything further about the position that Clearview will take in relation to the sale of accidental death products going forwards? Uh, at this stage, I, I don't know. As I said, our, our intention, of, as far as I know, the intention of Clearview is not to offer rubbish products to the market. So if that's what they deem to be, that'll be stopped. Perhaps that's a convenient time, Commissioner. 2 p.m., Ms. Hall? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Adjourn until 2 p.m.
<coughs> yes, Ms. Orr. Mr. Martin, in your statement, uh, you deal with two sets of concerns that ASIC has raised with Clearview in recent years, both of which relate to the direct sales of life insurance. Uh, concerns firstly about whether Clearview was complying with the requirements of the Corporations Act in relation to unsolicited sales and secondly concerns about whether Clearview was engaging in unfair sales practices. Correct. Uh, and ASIC's concerns on both of those fronts have led to Clearview developing a customer remediation program. Correct. And that program's not yet complete? Um, no, it's very close. When will it be complete? Uh, probably by the end of November, almost certainly by the end of the year. And you tell us in your statement that you believe it will ultimately cover over 32,000 <coughs> life insurance policies that were sold by Clearview between the start of 2014 and the middle of 2017. Correct. Now, before I turn to the matters giving rise to that remediation program, I want to ask you some broader questions about operating in the direct life insurance market uh, and the views that you express in your statement about why things went wrong for Clearview in its direct sales operations. Um, you tell us in your statement that, in your view, the principal reason for these problems uh, was the underlying character of the sale of life insurance via outbound telephone sales interacting with the marked change in the operating environment of the direct business over the period from 2013 to 16. Do you recall that? Um, yes. Now, I want to deal first with what you describe as the underlying character of the sale of direct life insurance via outbound telephone sales. You tell us in your statement that life insurance is well known to be a grudge purchase. Yes. Yes. <coughs> what do you mean by that, that life insurance is a grudge purchase? Oh, it's a colloquial reference. Um, <coughs> it means, it means it's, it's like people doing their wills. It's like all sorts of things. People know they should do it, but it's not something that they uh, uh, willingly and, and uh, run off to do. You know, um, without usually with a bit of motivation, oftentimes from family and friends or, or other people. So purchasing life insurance is not something that people will generally do without a bit of motivation, did you say? Yes. You tell us in your statement that the life insurance sales process inevitably requires some level of customer disturbance to achieve engagement. Do you recall that? Yes. And what do you mean by customer disturbance? I only mean that in terms of, you know, people, you know, being um, um, encouraged to think about the consequence of them dying or becoming disabled and whether that, what that would mean for, for their families, for themselves. Um, um, that's all it meant by that. How did Clearview achieve customer disturbance? Uh, when it was selling its life insurance policies direct to customers? Well, um, it was meant to, that was only meant to uh, refer to um, at the beginning of a phone call, um, you know, challenging the uh, customer on the phone a little bit to think about uh, those particular matters. Um, you know, if you were to die, what would that mean for your family? Uh, if you become disabled, what would that become? Uh, what, that, what would that mean uh, for you? was only meant to uh, refer to that. How did Clearview ensure that the customer disturbance that it was aiming for uh, was fair and appropriate to the customer? Well, it was, through, uh, it was meant to be through the scripts that were approved uh, for the agents to, to read, that they would have um, some uh, agreed uh, points to raise on that area. Um, before they moved into talking about products, etc. All right, I want to come back to those scripts in a little while, but that was the way in which Clearview ensured that the level of level and manner of customer disturbance that it was aiming for was fair. Yes, that was what was intended. That and, and agent training, of course, that would have gone with the scripts. Yes. 
You, you acknowledge in your statement that there can be a fine line between fair and reasonable customer disturbance uh, to achieve engagement and crossing the line into pressure selling. Um, absolutely, yes. And where that line lies, you, you can see it is subjective uh, and subject to change with changing community views and expectations. Yes, broadly, yes. Where do you think the line lies currently? I'm, <laughs> I'd struggle to explain it, um, but it would be a, a, a mild level of disturbance to engage a customer in a, dis in a, in a discussion, um, and, but that's about it. And, and what would constitute a mild level of disturbance? That's a, a difficult question to articulate an answer to. Um, I, I'd call it, um, you know, just general questioning around, as I said, what are the consequences for you or your family? Um, have you thought about that? Um, getting people to turn their mind to that subject um, is, is about what I'm talking about, yes. And Nothing is, beyond that. Is that part of the emotional pitch that we saw referred to in documents before mm. lunch? Potentially, I suspect the reference to emotional pitch in those documents went a bit past that. Yeah. And how did it go past that? Um, as you were referring to before, stepping over the line into uh, um, going beyond an, an initial um, um, engagement through to um, pushing into pressure selling and all the rest mm. of it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so fair and reasonable customer disturbance is something short of pressuring the customer to make the sale. Is that right? Yes. Um, or, or um, as ASIC refers to in its report, um, um, a aggressive objection handling and things mm. like that. Mm -hmm. That's not what that means. Okay. So in your view, a mild level of customer disturbance is necessary to get customers to make the grudge purchase of buying life insurance? Well, get them to turn their mind to that's something they, they should be thinking about and engage in the conversation on it, yes. Okay. Now, the other part of the principal reason that you gave in your statement for why these problems occurred for Freedom, if, I'm sorry, for Clearview, um, was the marked change in the operating environment of the direct business over the period from 2013 to 2016. You recall that? Yes. Uh, and in your statement you referred to four principal changes in the operating environment in this period. They were the expansion of the do not call register, the increased competition in the direct life segment, uh, and the increased scrutiny of the life insurance industry and a change in community expectations. Yes, I remember that. Uh, now, you tell us that the combined effect of all of those factors was not fully appreciated by Clearview at the time of the problems that I'm going to come to. Why was that? I, I just don't think we... Um I say we, was it the, those factors have, have emerged over the last three years. They, the fact that they were coming in 2014 or 13, we, we didn't appreciate the consequence of those. Um, have, had we appreciated those, I suspect we would never even started the business. Wouldn't have started the direct life selling business? No. Mm -hmm. But you say that not appreciating those factors and the combined effect of those factors meant that you didn't make sufficient changes to the sales rates that you expected from your call agents? No, I think they were... The, the expectations for the business were cast with, uh, from a view of seeing what was available, well, what had the sort of level of sales had been achieved historically in that market um, and by other companies who'd entered it over the previous 10 years, um, and the expectation was we could do similar. Mm. So the sales rates that you set for your sales agents were, as you say, cut with a view of making sales, of making large numbers of sales? Um, yes. And you didn't make 
changes to your compliance or quality assurance program to reflect the changing operating environment that you've identified? Um, no, the model wasn't changed. And it should have been? I think it should have been, yes. Okay. Now, Clearview was one of the six insurers whose conduct was examined by ASIC in the direct life report, the one that you mentioned earlier you read the executive summary for? Yes. You know that? You know yes. that Clearview was one of yes. the insurers examined? And you know that ASIC's review uh, involved reviewing hundreds of outbound calls um, conducted both before and after the Life Code of Practice came into effect last year. Yes, I understand that. And ASIC found that outbound sales are more commonly associated with poor sales conduct and increase the risk of poor consumer outcomes. Do you agree with that? Um, yes. And do you have any views about ASIC's proposal articulated in the report to restrict outbound sales calls in the direct life insurance industry? As I said before, I haven't had a chance to read all the report, um, but I would only agree with that anyway, as a sentiment. Even though Clearview is one of the insurers whose conduct is examined in that report? If we had our time again, we wouldn't do that business. Okay. All right. I want to turn to the first uh, set of issues raised by ASIC. I, I mentioned that there were two sets of issues that you dealt with in your statement. The first one was Clearview's compliance with the provisions of the Corporations Act in relation to unsolicited sales. Um, these are referred to often as the anti-hawking provisions. Yes. Uh, are you familiar with those provisions? I have a, a good layman's understanding of them, I yes. think. Yes. So you know that section 992 capital A3 of the Corporations Act prohibits an insurer from selling a life insurance product to a person in the course of or because of an unsolicited telephone call unless the insurer complies with a number of specified requirements. Yes, I understand that. And those requirements include giving the customer an opportunity to be placed on the do not call register. Yes. And they include giving the customer a product disclosure statement before they become bound uh, to buy the insurance. Yes. And they include offering the customer the opportunity to have the information in the product disclosure statement read to them. Yes. Are you familiar with ASIC Regulatory Guide 38? Uh, general regu um, familiarity. You know that it contains guidance on the anti-hawking provisions? Yes. And ASIC makes clear in that regulatory guide that a telephone call will usually be considered to be unsolicited unless it takes place in response to a positive, clear and informed request from a customer. Yes. You're familiar with that standard? Yes. Did Clearview breach the anti-hawking provisions, Mr Martin? Um, our breach notice, I believe, said that we think we did, yes. And how many times? Um, well, that's some conjecture as to where that line is drawn. I think uh, the, um, we came to conclusion that a lot of the Bupa business in the end probably wasn't in, in accordance with those provisions. Um, I don't want to... This, there's a technical point, I suppose, as to when when you breach those, those provisions, when you just make a call to somebody, but there was something like a quarter of a million calls, I think, that we estimated that were made to Bupa customers. Um, I think out of the 32,000... Uh, policies that were sold, uh, I think it was 40% of them or maybe a little bit more were Bupa customers. Um, potentially all of those were in breach of those provisions because we didn't have sufficient um, uh, recall, f f f recall, positive um, affirmation that they were wanted to be called. So roughly how many times do you say Clearview breached those provisions? <laughs> I haven't got the exact number, but 10,000, 12,000 times, something of that order. I, I can't tell you the exact number off the top of my head. All right, we'll come back to that. Um, over what period did Clearview breach the anti-hawking provisions? Um, for at least the period of uh, um, 
the outbound telemarketing, the Clearview Direct business, so from from late 13 through to um, uh, the end of 16 when the, um, the scripting uh, was all changed to make sure it met the unsolicited tests that you referred to before. And in what ways did Clearview breach the anti-hawking provisions? The, as I understand it, it was that the um, customers didn't opt in sufficiently to meet the definition of solicited calls. Um, and then Clearview failed to meet all of the tests under the unsolicited uh, arm of the of the law. Um, we did meet, meet a number of the uh, requirements, for example, not calling people on the do not call register. Um, uh, it was my belief that we that was the, was the process that everybody received a, a product disclosure statement before they were phone called. Uh, but there were some aspects, I think, as you referred to a minute ago, such as offering a customer to be put on the do not call register, we failed to do. One or two others, I think. I can't remember exactly what they were, but there was those. The anti-hawking provisions apply to calls irrespective of whether a sale is made in that call, don't they? It, I understand that, yes. Yes. All right. And breach of the anti-hawking provisions is a criminal offence, isn't it, Mr Martin? I understand that, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when Clearview was selling life insurance directly to customers, um, all products were sold via telephone sales, weren't they? The, the direct products were, yes. Yes. And how did Clearview identify the people that it was going to call to attempt to sell a life insurance product? Um, for, do you want me to run through Boopa and the whole lot, is all of it? Well, there are a some... number of different methods yeah. that yes. Clearview used, weren't yeah. there? Could you explain in general terms what each of those methods are? Um, the two main, the two main uh, sources of um, customers to call. Uh, one came from our, our um, alliance with Bupa, where Bupa supplied us with uh, databases of customers that, that were available to be called. Um, my understanding is that would typically be a, a list each month or each quarter. Um, Bupa controlled uh, that list to try and, uh, from their perspective, um, uh, you know, with their other strategic partners, make sure people, their own customers weren't being um, you know, uh, pestered, I suppose, if you like, by too many of the strategic partners at the one time. Um, that l list was then, um, as I understand it, either by Bupa or us, washed against or compared to the do not call register. And customers who were uh, eligible to be called would then be loaded into a, a what's called a, a dialer or a telephone dialer, and that machine would then dial people and assign it to a, a call agent, I think was the process. Um, there may have been some ability of the, for the agent themselves to pick somebody off a short list who, who they might like. But all, um, of, all of those customers came from a list from Bupa. Bupa, correct. Yes, yes, so that was one method. method. Uh, the other main method was the lead generation uh, 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 channels that Clearview Direct used, uh, where they would have um, um, various means of, of accessing customers who expressed interest in life insurance whether that might be an online competition or other uh, outbound um, lead generation telephone uh, uh, means. Um, usually they were through some sort of list as well that they would have that would be customers who was, uh, should be suitable. They would inquire of the customers whether they were interested in a, in, in a call from Clearview. Um, and if they opted in, those customers would then be transferred I mean, the names, the telephone numbers and details of those customers would be transferred to Clearview and loaded into a dialer. Um, and sorry, for both Booper and those ones, there would be a step in the process where they were sent electronically, uh, the PDS mm -hmm. and other material prior to a phone call coming from Clearview. That was okay. the broad, broad, broad process. Okay, so there's the list of Booper, com uh, Booper customers. Um, that list is given to Clearview and they're then emailed a copy of the PDS, is that right? Correct. So uh, and then they get a call from Clearview to promote the products? That was the process. Um, sometimes Clearview used uh, a third party or a partner uh, which contacted a potential customer and asked for their consent. Yes. Is that right? Uh, and 
an example of that was Community Mutual Limited, is that right? Are they one of the partners that Clearview had who made those calls and got the customer's consent? The Community Mutual uh, relationship I was a very small one that started in the early days. It didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. I thought that my, my recollection or understanding of that arrangement uh, was more that that was customers of Community Mutual who um, I think the intention was when they rang their call, their own call centre, their service centre, they would be asked whether they had an interest in life insurance and, then, and then forwarded. I think that's right. That, that relationship, I, my belief, was very shortly back in uh, 2014. Okay. And then another method was that you got customer details as a result of someone registering their details to enter a competition uh, on a website. Um, yes, and in that process, opting in to uh, uh, being called about life insurance, yes. So they'd register their details on the website and then they'd click on a Clearview ad. Is that how it worked? I think there was, was a range of op uh, options. I think that possibly was one of them, yes. Yep. Uh, and then you had the lead generation channel, which involved you buying customer information from third parties. Is that right? Um, well, the lead. There was also well, there was also um, data, a relatively small amount of data uh, from other, um, as you said, list list owners. Mm -hmm. People had customers who who had who were marketing companies that that had customers who opted into things. Um, the main one, though, was, uh, uh, as I said, outbound, um, what I understood to be a large amount of outbound telemarketing or other ways of accessing customers to, uh, to generate interest in, the, in, the, in, in, in products, and not necessarily just life insurance. It would be a range of products. And we paid for those. Yeah, yes, clearly you, you, paid purchased, for those. Yeah. you purchased customer information. Yes. Um, and you purchased it from third parties like value add lead allocation? Yes. And Greater Data Proprietary Limited? Yes. And the Bradford Exchange Limited? Yes. So all of those were entities that you bought information about customers from who you then contacted? As I understand it, yes. Okay. Now, ASIC first raised concerns with Clearview about potential breaches of the anti-hawking provisions in April 2016 because they'd had some complaints. Do you recall that? Yes. And ASIC asked Clearview to give it information about how it got details of the customers that it called. Um, yes. Uh, and there was a letter uh, that ASIC sent to Clearview about those matters which you've annexed to your statement and Clearview responded to that letter and provided that information. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, I do. Um, that response from Clearview was on the 22nd of April 2016. That sounds right, yes. Now, you've annexed the letter from ASIC asking for that information. Um, you didn't annex to your statement the response to that request. Was there a reason for that? Um, no, I, I can't. I can't help you with that. No, I don't. There was no particular reason. I don't believe that we didn't provide that. Well, you I mean, know that the Commission asked Clearview to exhibit all relevant correspondence with ASIC in relation to whether the sale of its life insurance policies via outbound calls may have contravened regulatory requirements? I'll say yes. OK. Yes. Well, can I take you to the letter that Clearview sent to ASIC, um, which we've obtained? Uh, that's... ASIC 0052000300. And this is the letter from Clearview to ASIC on the 22nd of April 2016. You've seen this before, Mr Martin? Um, yes, I've seen it before. Yes, and it's a lengthy letter containing the information that we've just summarised about the ways that you identified your customers. Yes. I tender that letter, Commissioner. A letter, clear view to ASIC 22 April 16, ASIC 0052 0004 0300, exhibit 6.35. 
So this is April 2016, <coughs> and there's then some further correspondence between ASIC and Clearview. And then in December of that year, there was a conference call between ASIC and Clearview that you participated in. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Okay. And during that conference call, ASIC expressed multiple concerns about possible contraventions of the anti-hawking provisions by Clearview. Yes, they did. Uh, and ASIC said that it wasn't clear to them that customers were always being given a product disclosure statement before being bound to acquire the product. Do you recall that? Yes. And they also said that it wasn't clear that customers were explicitly being offered an opportunity to be placed on the do not call register. Yes. Uh, and that consumers were not being offered the opportunity to have the information in the PDS read to them. That's correct. So those were the concerns expressed by ASIC at that time, but Clearview's position in that meeting or that conference call uh, was that the phone calls that it made were solicited. Do you recall that? I, I recall that that was the belief at the time, yes. Yes, that was an incorrect belief. That was an incorrect belief. All right. ASIC then reviewed information and audio recordings that it got from Clearview and sent further correspondence in December 2016, indicating that it believed that Clearview might have been failing to comply with the anti-hawking provisions on a systemic basis for at least three years. Do you recall that? Um, yes, I recall that. Mm -hmm. And then 10 days after Clearview got that communication from ASIC, Clearview lodged a breach notification with ASIC. That's correct. Now, you didn't annex that breach notification to your statement. Was there any reason for that? Uh, no, I have to apologise for that. that was... All right. Well, again, we have that from ASIC. We have obtained it from ASIC. And it is ASIC 0052 I'll just ask you to go to that. Uh, now, it's a three-page letter, but the bulk of it is on the first and second pages, and it would assist if we could have both of those pages on the screen. We see on the first page, which is now on the right-hand side of the screen, that Clearview said that it wished to notify ASIC that it had identified likely non-compliance with Section 992A of the Corporations Act. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And we see from that page and over to the next page that the likely non-compliance was said to relate to some telephone calls, there was no indication of how many, that were made by Clearview over a two-year period um, from the start of 2015 to the 9th of December 2016. Do you see that? So where, which, which part of the letter is that? On the left-hand side, the heading Notification of Reportable Breach, two paragraphs under that. We wish to notify ASIC. Oh. Likely non-compliance with respect to telephone calls yes, I see it. made Sorry, by Clearview. I see it. Yes, do you see that? Yes. And Clearview said that it was undertaking Further inquiries, we see this over the page at 0528, um, under the heading reportable breach, second paragraph down, undertaking further inquiries to determine whether there had been any non-compliance with respect to other periods and products. Sorry, I'm trying to speed read. Um, it, I it's, don't, it's the I, second I, and third read, paragraphs yeah. under the yeah. heading reportable breach. Yes. And under the heading rectification, Clearview also said that it considered that any failure to comply with the anti-hawking requirements had been rectified after Clearview had updated its call scripts, retrained its sales agents, and amended its quality assurance checklist. Do you see the references to those matters in that section? 
Yes, I do. So prior to this, Clearview's scripts didn't reflect the requirements that need to be met in an unsolicited call, did they? No, they didn't. They should have? Uh, yes. Uh, I tender this letter, Commissioner. A clear view breach notice to ASIC 23, December 16, ASIC uh, 0052-0030527, Exhibit 6.36. So this is December 2016, uh, and shortly after this, in early January 2017, Clearview again wrote to ASIC about the anti-hawking issues. Um, that's, yeah, I recall that. Yes. It, it's another letter that's not annexed to your statement. Apologies again, oh, sorry. Okay, we, we have it from ASIC. It's ASIC 0052 Now This is a lengthy letter from Clearview, um, signed by the Head of Legal and Company Secretariat. Have you seen this letter before, Mr Martin? Yes, I have. And you know that by this correspondence, Clearview accepted that some of its campaigns involved unsolicited calls? Um, yes, uh, that's correct. Yes. And if we go to 1368, we see that these were generally said to be, I'll just wait till it comes up on the screen. Under the heading unsolicited campaigns, they were generally said to be situations in which Clearview had purchased customer information and then proceeded to contact the customers to offer them products without that customer having received a call from a third party. And where are you reading from, Ms Hall? I'm reading from a, a couple of paragraphs on this page on 1368, Commissioner. I'm reading from... One three six eight. I'm sorry, I might have given the wrong. It is one three six eight, and I'm reading from. Under unsolicited campaigns, the section that starts with those dot points, and we'll need to read through to the following page. Perhaps we can have one three six eight and one three six nine on the screen. I'll just let you read through that section. I think that's the simplest way of doing this, Mr Martin, because I'm bringing together themes from a number of paragraphs. But I expect this is a letter you are familiar with. Um, yes, I'm familiar with it. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. yes. Yes, so the, the calls that Clearview was accepting were unsolicited calls at this point in the letter were calls that were made to customers whose information had been purchased by Clearview, but the customer had not been called by a third party to get their consent before Clearview contacted them. Correct. They were customers who, yes. one way or another, had not sufficiently opted in. To so Clearview acknowledged that it hadn't complied with the anti-hawking provisions for every call made to customers um, whose details it had purchased from three different parties. They were the Bradford Exchange, Greater Data and Value Add. Yes. Uh, and Clearview acknowledged that none of the customers whose details were provided by the Bradford Exchange had received a lead generation call. It was my understanding, yes. Yeah. So that all of those calls were unsolicited calls? Yes, that was our conclusion. But there's no indication of this letter of how many calls they were. Um, we, I think in our original correspondence with ASIC earlier in 2016, we had given them information on all that. Are you I sure about that, Mr Martin? I, sorry, you're saying the number of calls? We, yes, uh, so you've acknowledged in this letter that the customer information that you bought from the Bradford Exchange had led to Clearview calling those customers without any lead generation call. That acknowledgement's in here. Yeah. But there's no indication yet of how many customers were affected by that conduct. Do you recall that? Um, oh, it's, I agree with you, it's not in this letter, yes. Uh, but there was an indication about some other 
um, aspects of this because Clearview acknowledged that some of the customers whose details it had bought from greater data and value add had not received a lead generation call and Clearview told ASIC that that was about 5,500 customers in that situation. Do you recall that? The 5,500, I'm just trying to confirm in my mind whether the not getting a lead gen was the point. But I'll, yes, I'll agree. Yep. And it's, it might help if you look at the second paragraph on the right-hand side. None of the customers provided by the Bradford Exchange were subject to a lead generation call. A small number of customers, approximately 5,500, provided by value add and greater data were also not subject to sorry. a lead generation yes, sorry. call. Sorry, yes. Um, then, in addition, on the next page, 1370, the letter dealt with your Bupa customers? Yeah. I don't think we have, have that, that on the screen, screen just yet. I'll wait till it comes up. Um, do you see the reference to the Bupa customers in the second half of this page under the dot points? What I want to put to you is yes. that Clearview didn't explicitly acknowledge a breach of the anti-hawking provisions in relation to its Bupa customers, but instead acknowledged that its processes for getting consent from those customers who'd received mail or email packs may potentially have fallen short of what ASIC expects in respect of receiving positive, clear and informed consent. Um, yes, I agree. That's what the letter says. And um, over the page at 1371, at the top, in the top paragraph, whilst the customers are advised to be contacted by Bupa's business partners, we acknowledge that may not be enough to render these clients solicited based on ASIC's guidance in RG38. Yes. So by this letter, Clearview acknowledged that it had made unsolicited calls to customers as part of multiple campaigns and that it had not complied with the anti-hawking provisions in respect of those calls. Yes. Uh, but apart from identifying the 5,500 customers that I took you to earlier um, who were called because their details had been purchased from greater data and value add, Clearview didn't in this letter say anything about how many customers were affected. No, they didn't in this letter. That's All correct. right. Now, attend to that letter, Commissioner. A letter, Clearview to ASIC, 3 January 17, ASIC 0052-001-1366, Exhibit 6.37. Now, ASIC was troubled by that, weren't they, Mr Martin? They were troubled by the fact that they didn't know how many customers had been affected by this conduct. I'm not sure that I was aware of that, but... Well, you've exhibited a letter to your statement from ASIC to Clearview um, on the 8th of March 2017, so shortly after this letter. It's Exhibit 53 to your statement, CVW 6000 0010848. It'll come up on the screen. And if we look at paragraph five on that first page, ASIC noted that no details have been provided regarding the number of affected customers sourced from either Bupa or Bradford Exchange. You recall that? Um, yes. And then at paragraph 13 on page 0850, ASIC indicated that the campaigns that Clearview still insisted were solicited campaigns may not be because ASIC was concerned that how Clearview was satisfying itself of the requirements being met um, was not adequate. Do you see the references on, in paragraph 13? ASIC wanted an explanation from Clearview of how Clearview satisfied itself of the various requirements of the anti-hawking provisions. Yes, I see that. Yes. There was then a meeting between ASIC and Clearview in April 2017, which you attended. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. 
And in that meeting, um, ASIC maintained the concerns that it had that the calls that Clearview were regarding as solicited um, were in fact unsolicited calls in breach of the anti-hawking provisions. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And ASIC again raised the issue that Clearview had only provided information about a small set of the unsolicited calls. Do you remember that? The 5,500? Yeah, I, sorry, I, I know the 500. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just struggling with to what extent ASIC raised concerns, but I'll I'm sure they did mention that. Yeah. Well, do you remember ASIC saying to you in that meeting that they needed to know the extent of the possible contravention so that they could form a view on what regulatory outcome they yes. should pursue? Do you remember I'm, that? I'm, I'm sure that's right, yes. And do you remember that you said to ASIC in that meeting that your best guess was that there may have been around 105,000 breaches with the Booper customers? Um, yes. But you thought it was probably more? Yes. All right. Then about a week later, Clearview gave ASIC some more information. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, and I'll take you to a letter that Clearview sent to ASIC on the 18th of April 2017, which is ASIC 0052 0001 1621. For a moment. Have you seen this letter before, Mr Martin? Um, yes, Miss Hall. Sorry, that was, uh, this letter was the one I was thinking about when you were asking me before I about see. when we told them how much, you know, I got confused as of the timeline. Yes. yes. So this is when the information is finally given about how many customers have been affected by this conduct in April 2017. Is that right? Correct. So in this letter, Clearview gives an estimate of the number of customers to whom contravening calls were made over a period of just short of three years. Do you see that? Yes. From that paragraph under um, the italicised number one heading. And what we see is that Clearview said that between July 2014 and the 20th of March 2017, the following prospective customers received telephone calls from Clearview and were spoken to by a Clearview sales agent in circumstances where we have been unable to verify that all of the requirements in section 992A3 of the Corporations Act have been met. And we see that there were 244,000 Booper customers, 6,000 Bradford Exchange customers, 9,000 Value Add customers, and nearly 2,000 greater data customers. You see that? Yes, I do. So all up at this point, Clearview assessed that on our maths, 261,602 customers had received Clearview phone calls in circumstances where Clearview couldn't verify that it had met the requirements of the anti-hawking provisions. That's correct. Uh, and there was still a six-month period that wasn't dealt with in this letter. Do you recall that? Yes. And in this letter, Clearview said that it was still going to give ASIC some more information about non-compliant calls in that six-month period, which ran from January to June 2014. Yes. I tender that letter, Commissioner. A letter, Clearview to ASIC, 18 April 17, ASIC 005. Two treble zero one one six two one exhibit six point three eight. Now that information about the other six month period was provided to ASIC on the fourth of May two thousand and seventeen. Yeah, that sounds correct. Yes. I, I have the letter and I'll show it to you. It's another one that's not exhibited to your statement. It's ASIC zero zero five two triple zero one one four nine seven. And if we turn to the second page, 1498, have you seen this letter before, Mr Martin? Yes, I would yes. have seen it before. Yes. yes, so if we turn to the second page and we see two tables there, and if we look at the second table, we see that it addresses that six-month period from January to June 2004, there'd been an additional 44,000 
calls to Bupa contacts where Clearview couldn't verify that it had complied with the anti-hawking provisions? That's correct. Okay. And Clearview said on this page, um, under the table, uh, that it had been unable to determine whether those prospective customers answered the call or were offered a financial product. I'm sorry, that's above... No, first line under the table. Yes. Uh, but based on a typical contact rate of 50 to 55 per cent of calls, Clearview estimated that the number of calls that were answered would likely have been between 22 and 25,000. Yes. And so there were also some updates in this letter to the figures for the period that had already been provided. So some minor updates to that. We see that the number was revised upwards from 261,000, I shouldn't say minor, 261,600 breaches to 278,664 breaches, plus the 44,000 breaches with the Bupa customers. Or the, the 22 or whatever it is. I'm sorry, yes, the 22 yes, to yes. 25,000 yes. of those that resulted in the customer yes. taking the call. So using that 22 to 25,000 figure, we see that all up by early May 2017, Clearview had estimated that it had breached the anti-hawking provisions, which as we've discussed was a criminal offence, somewhere between 300 and 303,000 times over a period of just over three years, between January 2014 and March 2017. Yes, that's correct. That's a bit different to the figure you gave me when I asked about this earlier, and to be fair to you, you said you didn't know the figure, but you estimated that it was 10 to 12,000. So that was, this is the number of phone calls. I was referring to the number of sales that came from these phone but calls. But why are you referring to the number of sales, Mr Martin? You understand, don't you, that the anti-hawking provisions have to be complied with whether or not the call results in a sale? I understand that. I, we were discussing at the time, I thought, in, in respect of the 32,000 sales. So I always said I about 12,000 of those were Bupa customers I that see. would have fought, come out of this 300,000. That's all I meant. So you accept that there were between 300 and 303,000 breaches by clear view of these criminal provisions in that three-year period? Um, that could be the, the total of it, yes. That mm. could be the total of it? Do you think there's oh, more? Sorry. 303 is, is the number of phone calls, yes. And the number of breaches that you've notified ASIC of? Yes. But in your submission to, to the Royal Commission in August this year, you gave a smaller number? What number didn't we... Sorry, I'm... Well, you gave the number of 278,664 calls. Do you recall that? So we gave the top table number, did yes, we? So sorry, that was a mistake then. Right. That's an error. It was, so you should was, That wasn't meant to... Sorry, that was a mistake. We yeah. should read that submission Being to the Commission as not 278,000, but between 300 and 303,000 breaches. Yes. OK. Um, I'll tender that letter, Commissioner. Letter clear view to ASIC for May uh, 2017. ASIC... Double zero five two treble zero one one four nine seven, exhibit six point three nine. Mr. Martin, why did Clearview breach the anti-hawking provisions between three hundred and three hundred and three thousand times in that three-year period? Because at the time that we were were doing that, we didn't understand that we were breaching the anti-hawking rules. It's a, it, it's nothing. That's, that's nothing more complex than that. We just got that wrong. We made a mistake. You just got it wrong? Is that what you said? We, it was wrong. And you didn't we, understand the way these provisions worked? Um, Cleview Direct obviously did not understand the way they worked and they were... They got it wrong, yes. This was a critical thing for a direct life insurance sales business to understand, wasn't it? Uh, yes. The critical thing for Clearview to ensure that it did not commit criminal offences in the way it contacted customers 
and attempted to sell them life insurance policies. Yes, I understand that. Um, but there was no understanding within Clearview of how those provisions worked or of the importance of complying with them? No, we understood the importance of complying with them. Um, the error uh, for Bupa was believing that the um, the way that the Bupa members, members were opting into the program was sufficient, and it wasn't in retrospect. That That is the critical point. Were there also inadequate escalation procedures within Clearview in relation to breaches of anti-hawking provisions at that time? At that time, the business believed it was meeting them, so it, we, we didn't escalate because we didn't identify that it was in breach. If we had known it was in breach, we would have fixed it straight away and or reported it to ASIC. Well, towards the end of that period, the document suggests that there was increasing awareness that what you were doing was breaching these provisions. Have you seen documents to support that proposition? Um, towards the end of... Towards the, the end of the three-year period over which the 300-odd thousand breaches occurred. Before the December letter from ASIC? Uh, the December 2016 letter from ASIC? Yeah. No. How about I take you to a document, Mr Martin, which is CVW 8000 You seen this document before, Mr Martin? Yes, I've seen that. And have you seen... Um, on the second page of this email chain, which is an email chain um, between the head of group risk and compliance at Clearview and Mr Simon Swanson, who was the managing director of Clearview, copied to you in February 2017. Yes. If we look at the second page, we see under the heading Culture and Oversight, the quality of risk and compliance awareness and oversight from direct is concerning. Examples include the January 2017 Direct Risk and Compliance Committee meeting pack did not present the full picture of what occurred with the sales agent who had four anti-hawking breaches in January. All the pack disclosed was this agent was provided with additional coaching and when behaviour did not improve, she was dismissed. This was a more severe risk and compliance event than was portrayed. Yes, I see that. Um, so you accept that at this point, there were concerns within the business, not just about breaches of the anti-hawking provisions, but about the way those breaches were being escalated and responded to within the organisation. Yes, Ms. Orr. This, this, um, this email was, as you said, in um, February mm. um, 17. Mm. So ASIC had raised their concerns in December. We right. fixed or addressed whatever we could straight away. We put stronger QA. We, the scripts were meant to be changed or were changed. And then this is in uh, January, following yes. that process, that we then discover in Clearview Direct that a sales agent is essentially not following the new script, not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and at that point, uh, head office um, <laughs> realised that the direct people just didn't seem to be getting it. Well, and it's not just, when you say the direct people, are you talking about the sales agents or the people running the direct business? The, the, the management of Clearview Direct. Yes, I see because they were not treating breaches of the anti-hawking provisions as material, as things that required escalation and consideration. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. All right. I tender that document, Commissioner. Emails of 14 February 17 between Lee Swanson, Martin, uh, CBW 8000-0002-1124, Exhibit 6.40. Uh, now, Mr Martin, I want to turn from the anti-hawking breaches to the second 
of the two sets of ASIC concerns that you deal with in your statement. Um, the second relates to the sales <coughs> practices of Clearview's sales agents. Now, in the letter that ASIC wrote to Clearview in March 2017, as well as dealing with anti-hawking breaches, ASIC also raised concerns about sales practices. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Now, if we could go to that letter, which you've exhibited to your statement as Exhibit 53, uh, CVW 6000-0001-0848. Now, if we look at uh, 0851 within this letter, We see at paragraph 22 that ASIC told Clearview that it had reviewed the transcripts of 42 Clearview sales calls, which took place <coughs> in the second half of 2015. Yes. And most of those calls, um, if not all of them, related to the sale of Clearview's injury cash product. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, and ASIC said in this paragraph that its review raised concerns that Clearview and or its sales agents may be engaging in sales practices which are in all the circumstances unfair or manipulative and which may ultimately pressure consumers to acquiesce to a purchase of an insurance policy. Yes, I see that. And over the page, I'm sorry, still on this page, but if we could um, uh, focus in on paragraph 23 we see that ASIC raised a concern that Clearview's conduct might be in breach of its <coughs> obligation under Section 912A of the Corporations Act to ensure that its financial services are provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Yes. Uh, and ASIC also raised in this paragraph that the conduct might also amount to contraventions of several consumer protection provisions contained within the ASIC Act. Yes, I see that. Now, on the next page of this letter, 0852, if we could have that brought up with 0853, we can see that ASIC had 12 particular types of concern about the conduct that it had observed in the sales calls. Now, I'm not going to ask you questions about um, <coughs> each of those, but do you agree that um, some of them related to sales agents misrepresenting or using unclear language uh, around whether a customer was committing to purchase an insurance policy? Yes. Uh, and uh, that included concerns about the use of language or explanations by sales agents um, to the effect that there are no contracts which caused confusion amongst consumers about whether what they were in fact committing to purchase was an insurance policy. Um, yes, I'm aware of that. Um, now, can I play you an example of um, one of the 42 calls? Um, and I want to ask you if you accept that this is a call where uh, confusing or misleading language is used um, at the point of purchase by the consumer. This is a call that was made by a Your Insure agent. Uh, it's a call that was 15 minutes long in total, but I'm just going to play you a portion of it. It's ASIC 0069 0001014A, and the transcript is ASIC 0069 0001 0492E, and if we could bring up 0499. Confirm your eligibility for the cover. Can you please confirm if you'd like to proceed with an application for this policy to see if you're eligible as well? Yes or no? Sorry? Confirm your eligibility for the cover. Can you please confirm if you'd like to proceed with an application for this policy to see if you are eligible? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, I think 
we weren't focused on the part of the transcript mm. that related to that. I'll just ask that that be brought up again. What we can see in the bottom part of the page and what you heard, I'm sure, was the your insure agent saying to the customer, OK, to confirm your eligibility for the cover, can you please confirm if you would like to proceed with an application for this policy to see if you're eligible as well, yes or no? Yes, I see that. You heard that said at that sort of pace twice by the um, sales agent? Yes. And you heard the customer in between say, sorry? Yes. He had to ask for the question to be repeated a second time because he didn't follow the question the first time round? Yes, I heard that. Now, the question asked by the agent didn't make clear that what the customer was doing at this point in the call was in fact committing to purchase an insurance policy. That's correct. He that, was giving a completely different impression. That's yes. right. So the answer to that question, which ultimately came of yes, by that answer, this customer committed to purchasing an insurance policy. Yes, they did. Do you think the customer understood that no. that was what they were doing? No, I don't think they did at all. So I assume you accept that that was an unacceptable way for the sales agent to conduct this call? Completely unacceptable. And, and indeed to conduct the critical part of the call where the customer is asked for their consent to purchase the policy? Yes. All right. I tender that um, recording and transcript, Commissioner. A recording of sales call, ASIC 0069 0014. A exhibit 6.41, transcript of sales call exhibit 6.41, ASIC 0069 0001 0492E exhibit 6.42. Now, some of the other issues identified by ASIC in relation to sales practices in that March 2017 letter um, related to misrepresentations about payment arrangements. Do you recall that? Yes. There were a few aspects to that. Um, one of them was um, that there was a failure to clearly explain to customers before procuring their agreement to proceed with an application for the policy precisely when the first premium would be due and instead making vague statements to the effect that no payments are due on the day the insurance policy is issued. Yes, I've heard that. You've heard that in the calls that were sent to ASIC? Yes. And ASIC was also concerned about quoting premium prices in weekly terms rather than on a monthly or annual basis consistent with the payment frequencies that were permitted under your direct debit arrangements so as to under-emphasise the extent of the financial liability for the customer? I'm aware of ASIC's view on that, yes. And that was also conduct that you've observed in listening to those phone calls? Yes. Uh, and another concern that ASIC had on this front was that Clearview was representing to consumers that the premiums owing under the policies never go up with the customer's age without a qualifying explanation that Clearview was entitled to change the premium rates at any time upon giving notice. Yes, I'm familiar with that. So you accept that all three of those misrepresentations in relation to payment arrangements are evident from the batch of 42 calls reviewed by ASIC? Yes. And another issue identified by ASIC related to Clearview putting pressure on customers to sign up immediately? Yes. ASIC saw Clearview sales agents persisting with their sales pitch rather than offering customers an opportunity to be contacted at a later time or date um, when they were told by the customer that the customer wanted to read and consider the PDS or consult with a family member or a friend or otherwise consider their position before purchasing. Yes. So you observed within those 42 calls sales agents pressing through to a sale despite those objections by the customer? Yes. And ASIC also observed instances of collection of a customer's personal information before they'd confirmed their agreement to proceed with the purchase, including yes. bank details. Yes. You observed that in yes. those calls as well? Uh, and there was also an issue relating to misrepresentations 
on the terms or application of the policies. Do you recall that? Yes. And ASIC saw instances of Clearview failing to tell customers that the policies didn't apply to pre-existing conditions before they secured their agreement to proceed with the policy. Um, yes, ASIC raised that. I, we, we did um, have some discussions about that because most of our contracts didn't have pre-existing exclusions that uh, apply to a lot of other direct products, but to the extent that they were relevant, they weren't, they weren't mentioned. Okay. So you accept that each of those problematic, highly problematic sales practices were evident from the Clearview sales calls that were reviewed by ASIC? Yes. Thank you. Uh, now, in mid-2016, just after Clearview provided copies of those 42 calls to ASIC, um, Clearview decided to do its own review of those 42 calls, didn't it? Yes. And in the course of that review, Clearview listened to many of those calls for the first time? Yes. And only 10 of the 42 calls had previously been monitored as part of Clearview's quality assurance processes? That's correct. And of those 10 calls that had been listened to previously, do you know how many of them failed Clearview's quality assurance processes? I don't recall sitting here right now, but I know it wasn't many. It was a small number. And the 10 calls were reviewed again in the further review that Clearview did? Yes. And at that time, Clearview detected three breaches that hadn't been detected in the first review? Correct. And yep. Clearview's group compliance manager asked that an incident report be prepared once she worked that out. Do you Correct. recall that? Yes. Uh, um, now, can I take you to the incident report, which is CVW 8000-0002-1085. This is the incident report, Mr Martin. And we see there that in response to the question, how discovered and root cause, the person who completed the incident um, notification form said, all 42 calls were listened to and assessed against our current quality assurance process. 37 of these calls had file notes against them. These notes were simply referencing points within the call and did not necessarily indicate an indiscretion or a breach. Yes. Do you consider that that statement about the notes being simply referencing points within the call um, minimised the problems that were evident in these calls? I think it was an attempt to minimise and not address the issue. Attempt to minimise in a breach notification form? Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Clearview incident report concerning incident between May 15 and December 15, uh, CVW 8000-0002-1085, Exhibit 6.43. Could I ask, um, Mr Martin, that you look at CVW 8000-0002-9179? This is an email chain. Have you seen this email chain before? Mr. Martin? It's an email from Thomas Flint, who we see from the final page in the chain, 9181, was the Clearview Operations Risk and Compliance Manager. And he sent an email to David Charlton, who's the General Manager of Direct. Yes. Uh, which provided what he described at page 9179, if we could bring that back up again. 
at the top of the page as some clarification to the ASIC review. Do you see that? Sorry, which, which, which part of the Right document? up the top. Oh. Hi, Simon. Just providing some clarification to the ASIC review. And Mr Flint said that upon Clearview's review of the total sample of calls, only 18 had an issue. Do you see that? It's a few lines down before the dot points. Yes. And nine of the 18, um, the issues related to product coverage misrepresentations, ASIC would not detect as these are technical definition nuances. Yes. And six of the 18 could be determined as potentially being unaware of taking out the product, that's the customer, unaware of taking out the product and relate to soft sell or push payment practices. In all cases, client clearly expresses authority to proceed with purchase when asked. You see that? Yes. Um, and then one of the 18 calls failed Clearview's strict quality assessment due to a privacy prohibition. Yes. And in Mr Flint's words, two of the 18 calls fall into unconscionable conduct territory, which will raise the ire of ASIC. Uh, and we see that he says that in respect of those two calls, one of the customers indicated financial difficulty and the other suggested they were on a disability pension and had trouble reading or writing. Yes, I see that. Uh, so this was the commentary within ASIC as a re I'm sorry, within Clearview as a result of Clearview's review of the 42 calls that ASIC had called for. Yes, this was, as you said, the um, between people in Clearview Direct. I'm not quite sure why it says Hi Simon at the top of that, but yes. that, that was between. Um, almost looks like it was something drafted for the MD that never got there, but um, yes, it's between internally within the direct team. And what do you think when you read this assessment of the calls that was made internally by Clearview? You've listened to them? Yes. What do you make of this? In the calls or the email? The word appalling comes to mind. Uh, are you referring there to the response within Clearview? I'm referring to the fact that the, those calls exist the way they are and the, the language being used there almost to minimise the consequence of it all. So you agree that there was minimisation within, within Clearview the, within the Clearview Direct of the team. problems that were evident in these 42 calls that ASIC was also reviewing? Correct. Right. Attended that document. Emails concerning ASIC review breakdown 28 June 16 CVW 8000 0002 9179 exhibit 6.44. So this is June 2016 when the internal discussion within Clearview is at this stage uh, and then in late July 2016 um, uh, you become involved in this because Clearview's group compliance manager reports to you on another review of the 42 calls that's been undertaken by Clearview's legal team. Do you recall that? Yes, the Clearview head office legal and compliance team um, basically reviewed this and did their own sample review as well and came to some um, unattractive conclusions. Well, the legal team's conclusions were strikingly different to the conclusions that we see in this email, weren't yes. they? Yes, yes. All right. Could I ask that you look at CVW 8 000 000 email is um, in very small print and we might need to blow it up. If we could stay with 9176 uh, and blow up the email that starts at the bottom of the page from Jacqueline Scully to you on the 25th of July. So uh, the legal team, perhaps if we could also have the um, uh, the information that I'm going to ask you about is in this part of the first page and the second page. It's difficult to have both brought up on the screen because of the size of the font. But do you recall this email that was sent to you, Mr Martin? Yes, I do. And do you recall that 
the legal team identified 32 issues with the calls? Yes. Um, and they found that um, it, this will, it will help if I bring up the second page at this point, um, 9177. They found that 40%, if we could um, focus in on the top part of that second page, Uh, do you see the dot point under the table, our analysis of the results of the table above? 40% of the total sales calls included agent conduct that could be construed as misleading, deceptive or unconscionable, which are potential breaches of the ASIC Act. Yes, I do. And in addition, 31% of calls breached other mandatory requirements that are considered essential features of call scripting to ensure Clearview avoids potential deceptive sales practices so that customers are aware they are immediately purchasing an insurance product and do not have the features of that product misrepresented. You see that? Yes. Now, having received this email from the group compliance manager, you recognise that these issues might have a broader application, didn't you? I was recognised that there was, could be serious problems with this, yes. So you sent this email on. If we go back to the first page, 9176, we can see that you sent this email on to Simon Swanson, the managing director. That's the email in the middle of the page. Yes. And you said that it was unclear how these results may or may not reflect a sample of calls to other. I'll just wait till it's blown up. The second paragraph there. It's unclear how these results may or may not reflect a sample of calls to other, perhaps more affluent postcodes. Now that's because the 42 calls were identified by ASIC by reference to postcodes, weren't they? Yes, they were specifically identified for Indigenous postcodes. Yes. Um, and it was for the injury cash product in particular. So yes. it was a, a, a subset of... So you're concerned and you're expressing concerns in this email that the results could reflect um, a sample of calls for other postcodes as well. That said, to the extent these reflect similar issues with sales to lower socioeconomic customers in general, the results are concerning and would seem to amply vindicate the last year decision to pull back and eventually vacate this market segment. Yes. Uh, and then you said, uh, nonetheless, it is perhaps unclear why some of the issues discussed below would not arise to some extent in a sample of calls to any type of customer, affluent or otherwise. Correct. So we see there your concerns that these were broader problems that were permeating sales made by Clearview sales agents across the board. Yes. All right. Um, I tender that email chain, Commissioner. Emails concerning group compliance review, ASIC injury cash call, CBW 8000, 0002 9176, exhibit 6.45. Do you accept, Mr Martin, that the behaviour displayed by Clearview sales agents in the 42 calls was deeply problematic? Yes. Uh, and do you accept that in some of those calls the Clearview sales agents were engaging in misleading and deceptive conduct? I would describe it as that, yes. And do you accept that in some of those calls the Clearview sales agents were engaging in unconscionable conduct? Yes. Now, were the issues that were seen in those 42 calls in fact representative of broader compliance issues that Clearview was having at the time? We know now that they were, yes. And by the time that Clearview gave these calls to ASIC, Clearview had been aware of mis-selling issues within the direct sales business for many years, hadn't it? Not, not to any, well, when you say Clearview, um, Clearview Group, I don't think understood that this was happening at the time. We now know that it was happening, but we didn't understand that at the time. Well, but Clearview set up a compliance, a direct compliance forum in February 2014, didn't it? Yes. Um, and after that direct compliance forum was set up, it became clear very quickly 
that there were consistently high breach rates across the business, the direct business? Um, there was a level of breach when you say high. Well, higher than, you had a target breach rate, didn't you? An acceptable level of breaches. Uh, well, a, a, a level that we'd wanted to keep below, yes. And do you recall what that was? Uh, it was about 4%, I yes. think, was what they were working towards. So your tolerance was 4% non-compliance? The 4% was um, meant to recognise that um, the, 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 the nature of these calls uh, are a human process, they're conversational, um, it is it is difficult to stick to every element of a script. The 4% was meant to be um, that the QA was set on a fairly harsh basis, or we, we thought it was, um, and that, those, that, that there could be some, some level of non-compliance, well, a breach, simply because it's a human process. There were, um, it was meant to allow for the fact that there would be new agents uh, involved on calls. We would also have agents that potentially um, were agents that we could be under, um, what do you call it, uh, performance management as pl employees. Um, so th th there was accepted that uh, zero, zero is an aspirational thing, but we accept that there would have to be some level of, 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 of um, breach incurred, but not, not to the level of this, no. You didn't want it to be more than 4%? Correct but it was more than 4% consistently after the time that forum was set up. Do you accept that? I, my recollection was early on, but I thought that my, my, my recollection was it was below that uh, for most of the time that the reported breach rate was below that for most of the time of the forum. You recall it being higher early on, did you say? Yes, in the first few months. Yes, so the first quarter in which the forum operated um, your insurer, for example, was consistently recording compliance breach rates above the 4% target, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Um, sorry, by, my, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. I say my reference to below was actually talking, I was thinking specifically about the Clearview direct business rather than the your insurer business, but yes, your insurer was above that, yes. Yes. Uh, now, by uh, 2017, um, a decision had been made that the sales process in the direct sales business was not fit for purpose. Do you so, recall that? So, what was that date again? 2017. Yes. Uh, and if we look at CVW 5000-0001-2893, we see the February 2017 results from the Direct Risk and Compliance Committee. Have you seen yes. this document before? Yes. Now, if we turn to 2895, We see a distinction there between flagged agents and standard agents. Can you explain the difference between those people at the, um, in the table? Um, yes, under the QA process that was designed, it tend, the uh, objective of it was to um, put more energy and oversight on uh, agents that were uh, described as flagged. They would be typically new agents who were new to the call. Uh, centre uh, during their uh, early early days while they were essentially pea plates um, and uh, other agents who'd had a series of breaches in the past that were being monitored to check on them. Okay. So we, we tilted the, en the energy and the available sample size to those uh, agents and I think typically we would have something like 60 to 80 per cent of their calls would actually be monitored, their sales would be uh, monitored. Um, and then agents who are otherwise believed to be uh, reasonable or, you know, doing well, uh, we'd put a lower amount of uh, review on. So the flagged sales agents were either new sales agents or sales agents for whom compliance concerns had already, um, had, they'd been, already occurred? They'd, yes, we had a concern. So that put them in a flagged category and the others were standard, described as standard in this document? Yes. And we see that the average quality assurance score for the standard agents was 
Yes. And for the flagged agents, it was 69.22%. Yes. And the breach rate for standard agents was 20%. Yes. And for flagged agents, it was 27.94%. Yes. Which gave a total average breach rate of 25.81%. Yes. So by this time, it was clear that a quarter of all calls um, that were being monitored of Clearview sales agents involved a breach. Um, yes, well, this was, if I could just offer one little piece of explanation, this was just after we changed all the scripts for the anti-hawking matter that ASIC had raised at the end of December. And one of the, one of the key drivers of, of breach here was uh, agents who were um, still struggling with some of the elements of that. Um, so but agents, that said... It, agents who were still committing breaches of the anti-hawking provisions. They weren't ticking all the boxes for the new, the, the non-solicited uh, requirements that we'd put in. They, was, they were tripping over them. Um, I'd, that's part of why that was high. Having said that, it, it was also just high at this point, yes. It was very high, wasn't it? was very it? high. You had yes. a 4% target, but we see here that the average breach rate across both the people you'd identified as problematic and the people you hadn't identified as problematic was 25.8%. Yes. It, All right. It was unacceptable. So it was unacceptable. It was unacceptable, completely unacceptable. Um, and and that, that triggered really the whole, that was one of the events that triggered the whole wind up from that point. Yes, well, we see from this page that the breach rate for flagged agents exceeded the standard agent breach rate, but not by much, did it? The problems were just as bad for your flagged agents, for your standard agents, as your flagged agents. Yeah, it was, yes, it was. That's right. They were both struggling at that time with the anti-hawking, but that was was not good anyway. Yes. I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Direct Risk and Compliance Committee, February 17, results, CBW 5000-0012893, Exhibit 6.46. So I want to put to you, uh, Mr Martin, that the compliance issues that were identified in the 42 calls that were requested by ASIC were representative of much broader compliance issues within Clearview. We realised that by this time, yes. And they were issues that Clearview had been dealing with for a number of years? It would appear that they were in, almost endemic within the process for a number of years, yes. And they were issues that Clearview continued to struggle with in 2016 and 2017, even after the engagement of ASIC? Yes. Now, I, I want to put to you that there were um, three different causes for these systemic compliance issues. And I want to ask you some questions about each of these. The first was the remuneration structure that you had for your sales agents. Do you accept that that was one of the causes? That would be a driver, yes. And the second was a culture within Clearview that tolerated aggressive sales tactics at the cost of compliance? I would just qualify that to say a culture within Clearview Direct that, that, that would appear to have had that culture, yes. Uh, and the third is large scale deficiencies in Clearview's compliance program. The, the quality assurance program in Clearview Direct was inadequate, yes. Okay. Um, could I ask you some questions firstly about remuneration then? Yes. Um, Clearview sales agents who were selling life insurance via direct channels had a fixed and a variable component to yes. their remuneration, didn't they? Yes. The variable component was commission? Um, a commission, yes, in essence it was a bonus, but a commission, effectively yes. a percentage of sales, yes. And that was paid on a fortnightly basis? Uh, as I understand it, yes. And prior to 2016, the commission structure was a reasonably standard volume-based commission structure. Is that right? Yes, it was. Uh, and the amount of commission paid depended on the percentage of a sales target that the sales agent met? Um, yes, it was. Uh, and in the period from 2013 to 16, if a sales agent met 100% of their fortnightly sales target, they got a commission payment of between $600 and $850 a fortnight. Um, that, 
it's, that sounds familiar, yes. Yes, that's, this is from your statement. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to check the detail, but it sounds familiar, yes. Yes. Um, now, in the period from the start of 2013 to August 2014, you tell us in your statement that if a sales agent met 250% of their fortnightly sales target, they got a commission of $8,000. Um, that was a theoretical possibility, yes. Well, that was, that was the structure, wasn't yes, it? Yes. If they achieved 250% of their target, they got an $8,000 commission that fortnight. Yes. Um, do you think that that was a driver of inappropriate behaviour, Mr Martin? It was definitely a contributor to it, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, in August 2014, the $8,000 was reduced to $5,015 a fortnight. Do you recall that? Um, oh, yes. Take your word. Why? Was that in recognition of the fact that the $8,000 possible commission was driving poor behaviour by the sales agents? I would have... To, I, I don't recall um, exactly why, but I presume it was to um, probably bring back some of the... Um, um, what do you call it? Excess in the in the system. Yes. The I'm excess assuming. in the system. Yeah. As it, well, as you said, being able to earn eight thousand dollars or or offering that is a, a large amount. That was incentivising aggressive sales tactics yes. to make as many sales as possible at yes. whatever cost, wasn't it? Yes. Um, then in March 2016, Clearview moved to a different type of commission structure, which was a more complex commission structure. Yes. Why did Clearview do that? Um, that came out of the end of 15 when we closed the Your Insure business and the I think as we st started talking about uh, earlier this morning when we had unsatisfactory um, cancel from inception rates, un very high lapse rates, was all part of a program to wind back um, incentives at that stage. Um, and trying to um, encourage their sale agents to take more responsibility for um, the quality of the business and encourage them to uh, write better business. It was all part of um, trying to um, improve the quality of the business that was being written at the end of 15 into 16. But the new commission structure still rewarded sales agents by reference to volume of sales? Yes. There were some additional factors that went into the amount of commission paid, is that right? Yes. There was a quality assurance rating. Yes. Uh, and there was um, a consideration given to rates of cancellations from inception and dishonours. Yes. Uh, and there was also consideration in the calculation of the channel of lead. Why was that there? Um, I, I can't actually answer that question. That was... Uh I, I don't understand why there was a slight difference between the Clearview channels and the other channels. Um, I don't recall why it was there. I see. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Mm. There were three gate openers that were introduced at that time. Yes. Uh, prior to that time, there were no gate openers, just a sales target. That's correct. Uh, but from March 2016, there was a financial gate opener. Yes. Uh, and that meant that an agent was only eligible for commission if they wrote a certain amount of annualised premium? Yes. Uh, and they also had to sell a certain number of policies per fortnight? Um, yes. That was part of the financial gate opener. There was a quality assurance gate opener. Yes. How did that one work? Um, that meant they had to have a, um, a, a, a rating that said I forget what the percent was. It sixty, seventy percent was the absolute minimum of calls that had absolute um, no no issues with them. Not only not breaches, but met every um, internal um, process that Clearview had for the calls. Well, the the gate opener started. The quality assurance gate opener started um, as requiring a quality assurance rating of seventy percent or more uh, for about six months. But then from the 30th of November 2016, it was changed to only require a quality assurance rating of 60%. Yes. 
Do you know mm. why that happened? Were sales agents finding it too difficult to meet the 70 per cent target for quality assurance? I believe when I was um, preparing for this, there was mention um, of some changes to the quality assurance process at that stage and it was toughened up, so they changed it a bit. Um, it's not a... <laughs> It's not something I would have done, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I had visibility of it at the time. Well, they didn't toughen it up. They made it easier, didn't they, by taking the, the score no. that you needed to get down from 70% to 60%. Is no, that my, right? No, my understanding was the quality assurance process itself and the checklist was expanded and had um, more requirements on it, so it was harder to pass with a, a fully clean skin, so to speak. As I rec my understanding from what I've seen in material that that was the reason why it was done. I, I said I wasn't necessarily aware of this at the time. All right. So accepting that it became harder to pass, do, do I take from that that um, your quality assurance requirements were more rigorous and that you were taking greater care with whether your sales agents were complying with the law? Um, and internal. Uh, and your own requirements? requirements? Yes. That's, that's, my understanding was that the, the quality assurance process itself was toughened up at that point. But so in <laughs> to, I, I know to that counterbalance I, to, that, yes, I, you yes. then dropped the score that was required from 70 to 60 per cent. As I said, I, I, wasn't, I, I would not have done that myself. And that, I'm just saying by what I've seen um, within Clearview Direct, that was the, the rationale that they had. I'm only answering the question why they did it, I'm not saying it was a good idea. Do you think it was a good idea? No. Yes. And there was finally a cancellation from inception gate opener. Can you tell us how that one worked? Um, yes, yeah, so that was the requirement that if an agent had, um, had, had written business that had more than a 17% um, a or six. Uh, 27 for Clearview, that, um, more than a 17% um, cancel from inception rate, then that meant the, um, the agent wouldn't have got their commission for the, for the, for the uh, fortnight. So there were different tolerances for cancellation from inception rates depending on the channel, weren't there? Yes, there were. And uh, as I said before, I, I'm not sure that I understand exactly why we tolerated 27% mm. for, for Clearview. I wouldn't have tolerated that because at that point, um, I, Clearview's not making money at that point. I don't even understand it. So there was a much larger tolerance for cancellations by customers in the outbound sales channel, the Clearview sales agents, than in any other channel, wasn't there? It, Clearview Direct seemed to have done that, yes. So more than a quarter of the people to whom the agent sold policies could cancel the policy before any premium was deducted without affecting the agent's eligibility for commission? Yes. Was that acceptable? Uh, not to me. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell us in your statement that the average proportion of variable remuneration to fixed remuneration for the sales agents across the three years, 2000 and um, 13 to six, I'm sorry, 2014 to 16, uh, was generally about 30 per cent. Um, In paragraph 210 of your statement, you tell us that it was 29 per cent in 2014, 32 per cent in 2015, and 29 per cent in 2016. Sorry, I was remembering a number in its 20s, yes, but yes, 29, sorry, yes. Um, what's the comparison? Fixed to variable? Yes. Fixed is 30% of variable? Is oh, you tell us, uh, Mr Martin, and to make sure I haven't misinterpreted the figures, what is the 30% fixed or variable remuneration? My understanding is that of, of the total remuneration, 32% was variable, mm -hmm. which means 68% would have been fixed. Yes, thank you. Now, Clearview considered its commission arrangements to be an important feature in attracting direct sales staff, didn't it? Yes. Uh, and in motivating them to make sales? Yes. Uh, the commission that a sales agent could achieve was uncapped, wasn't it? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think that was a desirable structural feature of the commission model, Mr Martin? Um, given the nature of the business, no. We see from Clearview documents that it was regarded as driving a high performance sales culture. Yes, I've seen those comments. And the more you write, the more you earn. Yes. And by at least early 2017, Clearview had concerns about whether the balance it had struck between fixed and variable remuneration uh, was working. So Do you agree that, with that? So when was that date? From at least early 2017, uh, Clearview had concerns about whether the balance it had struck between fixed and variable remunerations for its sales agents was working. So do you mean 17 or 16? Uh, oh, do, do you accept that that was by 17, a concern that, by 2016? Well, sorry, I'm, I, we changed the model, in, as you said, in March 16 to bring in QA um, by 2017. Um, uh, uh, by two, early 17, Ms Orr, I, I, I was in the mindset that this business was being shut. Um, so I, you can, um, some of these details, I, yeah. I, I don't recall that it was changed further in 17, although that rings well, a bell. The reason yeah. I refer to early 17 is that by that point, your new commission structure had been in place for yeah. some time. Yes but it was still not resolving the issues with poor sales agent behaviour, was it? No. Mm. Uh, and we see from internal assessments of the direct sales business, uh, we see comments like this, which I can bring up on the screen if it assists, that the historic sales agent commission structure has been built with a relatively minor disincentive for compliance breaches and only applies to agents who are meeting a minimum level for sales, there has historically been no monetary disincentive to not breach for agents who are not meeting this minimum level of sales. Do you agree with that assessment yes. of the model? Yes. All right. Um, now, I, I want to turn from remuneration to the culture within Clearview, and you were careful to distinguish between the culture in Clearview more generally and the culture in Clearview Direct when I asked you about this before. What I want to put to you was that there was a culture, at least in Clearview Direct, that tolerated, if not encouraged, aggressive sales tactics at the cost of compliance. It, yes, I would, in <coughs> retrospect, we've now understood that, yes. Could I just take you to some scripts that your sales agents use to sell products? There were different scripts for each type of product, is that right? Um, yes. But there were common elements across a lot of the scripts. Yeah, the scripts, my recollection, are very similar except the product features and, and some of the lead-ins are different. So I want to take you to the injury cash product scripts um, that were provided to ASIC as part of the anti-hawking investigation and suggest to you that they show that it was part of Clearview's sales processes to try and get a potential customer to disclose enough information about their life to build trust with the person and to build a need on the part of the person for the product. Do you agree with that? Yes. Can I take you to ASIC 0052 0004 0594? Now, this is a um, script to be used in an outbound telephone call to attempt to sell a person um, the Bupa Injury Cash Insurance product. Yes. And we see at 0594 that it directs the sales agent uh, to discover the needs of the customer under the heading discovery, what is important to them, spend four to five minutes to build trust and need. Yes. Can you explain what building need means in this context? I, I would understand that to mean through conversation with the client to try and get them to turn their mind to um, what, uh, what, what their uh, insurance needs would be 
um, and to consider the product. Um, is that associated with the um, notion that we spoke about earlier of effective disturbance? Well, that's in the, as I said, yes, within the initial engagement to get the customer to you know, turn their needs to their, um, their risk exposure and their families to then consider the product, yes. And then at 0596, we see that sales agents were advised prior to the close of the call um, to recap on what was important for the customer, linking them to the product. Yes. Financial, children, partner, protection, etc. Yes. Why was this done? Um, I would imagine as part of the sales process that was to help reinforce the, the, the reason why the customer had bought the product and trying to uh, uh, improve their engagement on the whole sale. I'll tender that script, Commissioner. Booper Injury Cash Insurance Script ASIC 0052 treble 040594 exhibit uh, 6.47. Now, while we're looking at the close in this part of the script, we see that this script, like many other scripts, within Clearview frequently use the language of confirm with the customer in the close. Do you see that? Uh, you now, customer, can I confirm your direct debit details? Um, yes, I see those words. Was that deliberate that throughout these scripts the word confirm was used at points when something was being asked for? to convey an impression that it had already happened, that something had already been done and was just being confirmed? Up to I'd have to look at the whole script a little bit more carefully. When was the when was the when was when did the customer actually um, say yes to the application in this script? I'll, um, I'll let you look at the previous pages if that assists um, at 0595 and 0596. Uh, 0596 is the page we have. Perhaps if we could also bring up 0595. Yes, okay. Because uh, what I'm just referring to is under the quoting section is where it seems to be that the discussion about application mm -hmm. and everything's happened. So at this point, it should be confirming the, the sale rather than... But it's not confirming the customer's payment details, is it? The, well, sorry, the, the request is for the payment details. Could you provide me with your direct debit details? It yes, sorry, you're right. That I, I, probably I, would be better wording. Yes, yes sorry. I, I just wonder if this is a deliberate choice that the language of confirm is used all the way through these scripts, often at points when there is nothing yet to confirm. Um, the, I've not read it that way in the past, but now that you pointed out, um, given the other things we've heard on calls, that uh, is not inconsistent with that. Do you accept that in a number of these scripts, uh, a key piece of information, um, which is that the first payment is likely to be or will be debited within 48 hours, is not given until after the customer has provided their payment details. Um, yes, I agree that that's where it occurs, yes. Is that fair, that the customer hands over their payment details before they appreciate that within 48 hours the first premium will be deducted? It's a curious um, order, but yes. Is it fair to the customer? Does it allow them to properly assess the financial impact of the decision that they're making? Would have been better to discuss the whole thing up front before you got into that, I agree. Mm. Yes. All right. The, the scripts that were used by Clearview sales agents um, 
were generally authorised scripts like this one, um, but there were also unauthorised scripts that were being used at different points in time, weren't there? Um, yes, I'm aware that they were discovered twice. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to one of those that was discovered in early December 2015. Um, could I take you to CVW 5000000132331? Now, um, this is an email chain referring to the discovery of one of these scripts. Um, if we go to 3232, we see the script as an attachment to the email. If we could just take that page down because I think there should be a redaction within it. But we're looking for the page following, which is 3232. <coughs> if it's an attachment, it's probably gone in as a separate entry, I suspect, as. CBW 5000013232. Research on that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank me when it comes up, Ms. Orr, not before. More accurately, if it comes up. You recall this script, Mr. Martin? Have you seen yeah, it? Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it. And do you recall that? Um, it set out three different forms of close, a close being the final part of the call to close the sale? Yes. Uh, and do you remember that there were three types of close, one called the is it fair enough close, one called the partner close, and the other one called the I want to read it in black and white close? Um, I, I believe, yes, I... I know the scripts you're referring to. I can't recall the exact uh, words of them. I'm I was just appalled by them. You were appalled by them, did yeah. you say? Yes. Yes, yeah. so you remember the three different types of clothes yeah. and hopefully they'll appear on the screen to assist you in a minute. Um, but you said you were appalled by them. What, what was it that appalled you? Well, A, their existence when they're unauthorised. Why they were there, I don't know. Um, the language in it was... Um, yeah, you know, just I just found it a challenging and odd language, um, and didn't seem didn't do what it was supposed to do under the script. Um, it was really three different ways of managing particular customer objections, wasn't yes. it? Yes. So perhaps if I read to you the "Is it fair enough?" close. Bob, I have three quick questions I would like to ask you, because when you do receive everything and read it or even speak to your partner, these are still going to be the three questions you will still ask yourself. Now, if you answer no to all these three questions, I feel you're still not ready to take out cover. But on the other hand, if you do answer yes to all these questions, I'll get you involved today because you understand how it works. Is that fair enough? Questions. One, is the dollar figure per week affordable for you? Yes or no? Two, did you like the benefits? Yes or no? Which one stood out the most? Three, would your family benefit from this $500,000 if something happens to you? Yes or no? Can you please confirm you would like to proceed to purchase? Yes. That was one of the methods yes. that had been in use by sales agents for a few months when this script was detected? Yes. The partner close. Bob, I know you're serious about protecting your family because we've been on the phone now for 20 minutes. When you speak to your partner, you know him or her much better than me, but hand on your heart, will your partner object to this wonderful gift that you chose to give to them in the advent that you are not around to take care of them anymore? 
can you please confirm you would like to proceed to purchase? Yes. So that was another technique that had been yes. in use by Clearview sales agents for several months before this script was detected? Yeah, it's some of the sales agents, yes. And the final one, I want to read it in black and white, which is an objection to be yeah. used when a customer says, I want to read the details. Of course you do. I'm so glad you mentioned that our process allows you to do that. We cover you today, give you a policy and promise to pay your family if anything happens to you. It takes about three to five working days for you to receive all your documents in the mail and we encourage you to take your time going through everything because there's nothing malicious in it that would stop you from having cover with Clearview. It is a pay-as-you-go cover, so if you find that this cover doesn't suit you, then you're more than welcome to stop it. You're not locked into anything. However, I can't imagine why you wouldn't keep this cover based on what we've discussed, but the controls are always in your hands. Can you please confirm you would like to proceed to purchase? Yes. Uh, what, what would you like to say about those techniques that were being used by some of your sales agents uh, in 2015? I think I'd describe them as almost classic cornering techniques that you, um, sales techniques where you get somebody to say yes, 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 and sort of corner them into a purchase. It was deeply inappropriate again, yes, wasn't it? It was inappropriate. This is pressure sales tactics. Yes. Yes. Um, now, there was an assessment made by Mr. Koshot, Clearview's head of operations, that the use of the script appeared to be widespread and frequent. Have you seen that? Um, yes. The script was developed by one of the Clearview business managers? Yes. And the name of that business manager is the subject of a non-publication direction. Um, I'm just going to refer to him as the business manager. Uh, and the use of the script caused significant concern within Clearview, didn't it? Yes. Um, now, could I take you to CVW 8000000181? While that's coming up, I'm in the Commissioner's hands as to whether we tender the document that I was unsuccessful in bringing up on the screen. I've read the document into the transcript. Uh, it would be as well to have the document if we can. It's... Uh, Sorry. I think there's a hard copy available, Ms. Orr. Uh, email concerning script copy and attached scripts, plural, Ms. Orr, is it? One script. One um, script Mr. and Tish. attached script. CVW 5000-0013231 and its attachment, exhibit 6.48. Uh, the email is date 26 November 15. You're now going to CVW 8000-0010181, is that right? 8001. Eight double zero one. Eight double zero one. Triple zero one. Zero. One eight one. I'm dyslexic by this stage of the day, Ms. Hoare. Oh, I don't think yes. it's you, Commissioner. Um, now, you had accepted, I think, uh, Mr. Martin, that there was significant concern within Clearview about the use of this script, and I um, was going to take you to CVW Now, um, Mr. Koshot was the uh, head of operations, and we see that he framed his concerns in the bottom of the page. Aside from appalling grammar and a few statements about malicious intent, which I'm sure legal would like to be comfortable with, I'm worried that this is a cooling off script and that it may be an unauthorised script being passed around the floor, leading to high CFI cancellations from inception. Yes. And in response, we see that Mr. Julius, a direct sales manager, the direct sales manager, is that? Um, 
Uh, yes, he was very. He was senior. I'm just. I'm not sure exactly this date what his title was, but he was a senior person. Yes. Direct sales manager, mate. That is terrible. This is not a signed off script, nor have I seen, nor am I happy with the content. Mate, can you share? I won't read that next part. Um, and kill off any scripts that may be floating around. Sonia and I are having a scripting clean up and location made for scripts that are signed off in the next two weeks. Yes. Yes, I tender that email, Commissioner. Emails of 3 December 15 concerning script uh, CVW8001, 0001, exhibit 6.49. Now, two weeks later, Mr Julius took a different view to this. Can I show you CVW 8001-0001-0252? We see here, if we turn to 0253, the following page, we see that um, Mr Koshot emailed Mr Grant Elliott. Perhaps if we could have both pages brought on the screen at once. Mr Elliott was Clearview's head of contact centre delivery. You see that? Um, now, uh, we see that he emails in relation to an extremely disappointing display of behaviour from someone. Now, you know who that person is and it appears to us to be the same business manager who authored the scripts, is that correct? Yes, that's, yes, correct. Uh, so Mr Koshot says, I'm quite distressed by the experience. I will be considering my options with regards to what has transpired. The person has stated openly on the floor to me three times that my lack of support for the sales team is disturbing. Yes. I await a response from you, said Mr Koshot. Now, Mr Elliot, Elliot involved Mr Julius in the discussion and we see Mr Julius's response on the left-hand page. I'm aware of how this came about and from my view it's extremely poor leadership uh, from James with his continuous approach to find anything he can to smear the hard work of the sales floor. Regarding the issue at hand is around objection handle points once again with James more concerned with raising issues than understanding our process. Sorry, I am not in today to back my sales floor, which I seem to have to do each time I'm away from work. Now, Mr Julius, we see here, was defending the sales floor's aggressive objection handling, handling of objections made by customers in sale calls. He was defending them from critique from Mr Koshot, the head of operations. Yes. Was that appropriate? No. All right, I tender this email, Commissioner. Emails 18 December 15 between Koshot, Elliot and Julius, CVW 8001-0001-0252, exhibit 6.50. What? Yes, no, I'm sorry, I, I note on that on the second page there's various telephone numbers. It, it's an ex-employee, um, so it's not, as it were, a matter strictly for me, but I simply raise that for the Commission. I understand that ordinarily they would be redacted, but I'll leave it up to you. These documents have been through a redaction process by Clearview. We had understood that these were parts that they did not want redacted. Um, we are happy to further redact the document to remove those details. Very well. Uh, what actions, um, Mr Martin, were taken against this business manager in relation to the creation of this unauthorised script or in relation to the conduct that's referred to in this email that's on the screen? My understanding within the Clearview Direct um, um, business, um, not much was done. There was a, a warning and that was about a it. A warning? Yeah. Was that's that? My, 
Was that an appropriate response, Mr Martin? No. What should have been done? Um, this is very serious. Um, I think this would have to have been at least, well, I, I'm struggling with the whole culture that, 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 that surrounds this, to be quite honest. You know, what, what's the right answer? Um, uh, that's why I'm taking you to these documents, yes. um, Mr Martin, because of what they reveal about the culture within Clearview. Yes. What do they reveal to you? Um, as you said, this, uh, this reflects a culture within the Clearview Direct that was um, a, a full-on sales culture uh, without much regard um, for customers or, 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 in fact, the thing that I find you know, even... We didn't make money by doing this stuff. <laughs> and like this is sales for sales without actually a, an economic reward for it either. It's just, yeah, I and it sacked led, them. It led to very poor customer outcomes, yes. didn't it, yes. Mr Martin? Yes. All right. And this unauthorised script that I've taken you to, that was the second instance of an unauthorised script being circulated amongst Clearview sales agents, wasn't it? This one was a second one. Right? The, the script that I attempted to get on the screen but yes. did not, the one I read to you, yes. that was the second of, of two instances that I think you referred to earlier of unauthorised scripts. Um, I, there was one in 2015 mm -hmm. and then there was one that seemed to it have come back at late 16 into 17. I yes. see. So yes. it, was, it was subsequent to the first script that the second script emerged. Yes. Or right. and I think it may have even been the same script. I see. I see. Um, now, do you accept that there was a genuine tension between what Clearview's sales team, direct sales team, regarded as appropriate and compliant behaviour and what the compliance team regarded as compliant and appropriate behaviour? Um, I'd say there was a, quite a disconnect between Clearview Direct and Clearview... Uh, in general, yes. And that went on for some time, didn't it, Mr Martin? Yes, Martin? it went on unrecognised for some time. For many years? Yes, number Thank of you. years. Now, I, I want to turn to Clearview's standard authorised objection handling procedures. We've seen an example of some unauthorised objection handling procedures, um, but I want to take you to the ones that Clearview encouraged its sales agents to deploy could I ask that you look at CVW 5000003-5394. So this is a um, training package. It's a presentation from 2014 um, relating to the handling of Clearview sales calls. Uh, we see from this that it relates to inbound sales calls. Mm -hmm. Was there any difference between the objection handling um, practices across inbound and outbound sales calls? Um, I, I'm not aware of the, the of differences or similarities. These were um, sorry, I don't mean to distance myself. They were Clearview Direct internal mm -hmm. uh, documents that. Until recently, I had not personally seen, so I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I see. Can I take you to what um, this document encourages Clearview sales agents to do to handle customers' objections at 5405? Objection handle how many times on the call? Now, objection handle is handling an objection by the customer as to why they may not wish to purchase the life insurance, is that right? Um, yes. Those statements by a customer in a sales call are treated by Clearview as objections that need to be handled? Um, yes. Um, so how many times? Minimum three times. If more is necessary, then more. The difference between a salesperson and a customer service agent is objection handling. This is what I'll be looking for on every call. And then if we turn to 5406, we see an expansion. Remember, every time you objection handle, you increase your chances of selling by 
if you objection handle three times, you've increased your chances by 150%. Was this an appropriate message to be given, giving to Clearview sales agents? No. It encouraged aggressive and unfair sales practices, didn't it? It was unfair sales practices, yes. Yes. And it was, your sales agents were being trained to engage in unfair sales practices. Yes. Yes. And to understand exactly what they were being encouraged to do, I just want to take you to some of Clearview's objection handling scripts. I'll tender this document. Inbound sales workshop session three, objection handling CBW 5000003-5394, exhibit 6.51. Much of the objection handling was designed to get people to sign up and to get them to sign up immediately, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, now, if we look at um, CVW 5000003-0614. We see that this is a clear view document that contains a list of objections which are described as conversation triggers and the offered suggestion in response. Um, now, if we look at 0616, we see that the conversation trigger down the bottom of the page is, I don't want to add anything to my current policy. And in response, uh, the sales agent is directed to say, amongst other things, uh, if we go over the page to 617, perhaps if we can have both pages on the screen at once, we'll see that the sales agent is encouraged to say, last paragraph, the policy also comes with a 14 days cooling off period, which gives you the opportunity to review this policy's benefits against what you already have and ensure you have protection against accidental injuries as well. You see that? Yes. So the response sought to use what was essentially a protective feature of the statutory framework, the cooling off period, as a selling feature for a clear view policy. Yes. And some of the objection handling was designed to deal with a situation when a customer asked to have the product disclosure statement resent to them. Uh, if we turn to 618, we see the conversation trigger can you resend the PDS or info? Do you see that there? Yes. And the response is, after you have spoken about the product, second paragraph, I can do better than that. What I've gone through with you now is what you would have received in the post. And later on, you also get a 14 days cooling off period and you will be fully covered during this time. Yes. So why not have a script that tells the sales agent that when a person asks to have a copy of the PDS sent to them, they are to agree to send the PDS and re refrain from attempting to sell until the person has received and had an opportunity to con consider the PDS? It should have done. Mm -hmm. And some of the objection handling was also designed to dissuade people from speaking with their partner. Yes. and taking out cover immediately. You've seen that? Yes, same sort of techniques. Yes. Um, so you've seen the documents that show that sales agents were told to say, when a customer said, I need to speak to my partner, I'm so glad you see the value in working together and that you realise the importance of having this in place with your partner. I am curious when you say you need to speak to your partner what that might mean. Do you recall that? Uh, I remember words to that effect when I read these things recently, yes. And there was a tip in that same document, resell the benefits in an effort to empower the customer to make a decision without having the need to consult his or her partner. Yes. Why not have a script that tells sales agents that when someone wants to discuss a purchasing decision with their partner, the call should be terminated to permit them to do so? It should do. I have no argument. All right. Um, now, can I um, 
play a short extract to conclude. I'll attend to that document. I, I do. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Clearview in Injury Cash Insurance Conversation Triggers CVW 5000-0003-0614, Exhibit 6.52. I see the time, but if, if possible, I would like to play three short extracts from one telephone call to demonstrate objection handling in practice. Yes. Um, the recording is ASIC 0069-0001-0158C, and could we have ASIC 0069-0001-0356E on the screen? Now, this is the first part that I'm going to play of this call, Mr. Martin. You're in shore representing Clearview. How are you today? Not very well, man. Uh, courtesy call. Uh, it's nothing urgent. You spoke to one of our colleagues recently regarding the life and the personal insurances. And yeah. my job is just to explain the Clearview cover to you and just give you the information. Yeah. Um, yourself there. Uh, do you have like family? Uh, 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 six or oh, three kids, or oh, four kids that live with me and two that don't live with me. Um, mm. So they're very important to you. Yeah, <laughs> they're, yeah. Uh, you want to make sure that, and do you have a partner or, or wife? Yeah, I've got a missus. Okay, so basically the, these are the most um, uh, cherished people in your life, so God forbid if anything sort of like happens to you, you just want to make sure that there's some financial security there for them? That's it. Yep, yeah, okay, no worries. I'll uh, explain a little bit about who we are, the survey team. All right, now if we could move to a later part of that same call uh, at 0158D. <laughs> and the transcript is 0356365. I'm sorry, just 0365. So same customer, same call, slightly later on in this call that went for 17 minutes. like a um, package thing sent out and so I can sort of show the boss and, you know, um, before I commit to it, just so I can show the boss and, you know, read through the package and, like, so she can sort of see and I want to do both of us, you know what I mean? No, no, you can always, I mean, it's just so you can uh, be covered as of the phone call. There are no contracts oh, with no. it. If you want to, oh, like, yeah. what we do is um, you, we, we set up the cover for you. You get yeah. the documents posted out to you. All right. okay, yep, yep. And then if you want to add her on, just give us a call. It just means yep. that if, if something happens to you after the phone call, that's the money that, that'll get paid out to you. Right, yep, yep. Right. You happy with that? Now, we heard in that extract, Mr Martin, that this customer wanted to talk to the boss, uh, who we assume was the missus that he'd referred to earlier in the call. Um, that objection was handled and he was told... Um, in that part of the objection handling that there were no contracts, which was not correct. Yes. So an additional problem in the way he handled this objection, uh, because that was an untruth to say that there were no contracts, wasn't it? Yes. And if we could play the final part of this call, um, 0158E and display 0366 on the screen.
Okay. How do you spell that? I have trouble reading and writing, mate, that's all. So we played three extracts from that call. Uh, in the middle part, we heard the objection handling relating to the person wanting to speak to their partner. In the last extract, a very brief extract, uh, we heard the customer in response to a question about his address, trying to spell his address unsuc unsuccessfully and then indicating to the sales agent that he had problems reading and writing. That sales agent went on in those circumstances to sign up the individual to a life insurance policy, didn't he? Yes. Was that acceptable, Mr Martin? No. I tendered that transcript and recording, Commissioner. The recording uh, number is ASIC 0069 0001058, is that right? Yes, it is, Commissioner. A recording of sales call, that will be exhibit 6.53. Uh, transcript of the sales call, which is Exhibit 6.53, namely ASIC 0069 0001 is Exhibit Somebody's going to have the courage to tell me I've got the numbers the wrong. Number is, oh, sorry, Commissioner, I think the number is 356 at the end rather than 357. That was all. Yeah. Yes, we think it is 356, Commissioner. Uh, you, that's the doc ID for the um, transcript. Yes, yes, 356. Yes. Commissioner, if that's a convenient time, I'm, I'm not able to finish um, Mr Martin uh, before tomorrow. I, I think it would be useful to start again at 9.45 tomorrow if we could. Yes, we'll have to get you to come back at 9.45, Mr Martin. Yes, Commissioner. Thank you. And adjourn until 9.45 tomorrow morning. Mr Martin, uh, late yesterday I was asking you some questions about the way that Clearview uh, trained its sales agents in objection handling. Do you recall that? Yes. And we were looking at a document uh, containing training instructions, which I'll bring up again. That's CVW 5000 0002 This is the objection handling workbook that I took you to yesterday afternoon. Do you recall that? Um, <coughs> and we were looking at uh, conversation triggers uh, and responses to those conversation triggers. Uh, can I ask you to look at 6595 in the document? Now, this shows in the middle of the page the training that was given to Clearview sales agents if a customer said, I want to think about it. Do you see that there? Uh, yes, I do. And do you see that the response that Clearview sales agents were trained to give included making the following statement. Uh, I completely appreciate where you're coming from. I like to think about important decisions as well. Is this because you like to read over everything in black and white? Me too. The great thing is that I'm going to send out everything to you in black and white for you to read over to make sure everything I've told you makes sense. Putting the cover in place today means you will have the peace of mind that you're covered as soon as you hang up the phone. That was the training given to Clearview sales agents. Um, I'll, I'll say yes. I, I'm not quite sure that the the exact status of this document, although there was other ones you showed us yesterday that clearly yes. had 
Clearview training written on them. I'm, I'm not sure about this document. Well, but let's go back to the first page <coughs> of this yeah. document so you can see, because this is a separate document to the yeah, one that we looked right. at yesterday. I'll come back to that document as well, because I don't think I tendered that document at the end of the day, Commissioner. Um, and just so the Commissioner can check whether I'm correct about that. That one was... Well, Exhibit 6.52 is the Clearview Injury Cash Insurance Conversation Trigger document, which is CBW 5000003-0614. This one, I think, is not one we looked at yesterday, or if we did look at it yesterday. Um, I didn't take a note of it. No, I, I apologise, No, that's all right. Um, I will tender this document. I didn't show this to you yesterday. I just want to give you the opportunity to look again at the front page so that you can see that it's an objection handling workbook, Clearview campaign, and the metadata of this document as produced to the Commission tells us that it was dated the 9th of January 2014. Yes. So you accept that this was a training document at that time for Clearview sales agents? So I, I, I'm not trying to um, um, uh, dissemble here. It's just that it was on a, you're right, it was on an email. It was clearly within the direct business. I'm, I'm just saying I'm not sure exactly to what extent this was used, but I accept that it was obviously there, yes. Well, why do you have some doubt about whether it was used? It's a document Simply. that was provided to the Commission in response to a request yeah. for training documents. Um, oh, um, uh, sorry. Commissioner, I'm not sure that's technically correct. I think it's attached, as the witness said, to a particular email. So I'm not sure that um, it's necessarily produced separately as an individual training document. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's correct I, that it was produced yeah. and attached to an email, but it is a training document, isn't it? We see yeah. that from the nature of the document. Yeah, I'll accept that. Yes. Is all. Uh, and it's a clear view training document. That's clear from the front. And as I indicated to you, it appears to be from early 2014. Yes. Yes. Now, um, it's of a similar nature to the document I took you to at the end of yesterday, which was the document that dealt with conversation <coughs> triggers. And then you recall there was a column with a proposed response. Yes. This is another style of document dealing with the same yes. matters, how to handle objections. And what I had asked you about was the response that this document indicates that Clearview sales agents should give yes. when the objection made by the customer is, I want to think about it. Yes. Now, you heard what I read out yes. about the response to that, and do you agree that Clearview sales agents were trained um, when someone said they wanted to think about it to proceed to sign them up and tell them that they could read the policy documents after they had been signed up? Yes, I agree. That's what, it, what they were told. Well, and that's an entirely inappropriate way of conducting the sale, isn't it, Mr M Martin? Yes, I agree. All right. I tender that document, Commissioner. Objection Handling Workbook Clearview Campaign, 9 January 14, CBW 5000 0002 Exhibit 6.55. And I apologise for the confusion, Commissioner. The document that I referred to late in the day yesterday, which I have not tendered with the conversation triggers, was CVW 5000001-0747. I tendered that document as well. Just bring that document up because uh, I'm not sure that. And if we did see that yesterday, Ms. Orr, I'm sorry. I. Uh... This this is the. You, you're challenging my memory and oh, no, causing no. grave doubt, Ms Orr. It's Hall. my fault, Commissioner. No, I no. just want to find the part of this document that I took um, Mr Martin to. If we could bring up 0616 in that document. Can't be 0616. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could I ask Ms Zelesnikov to fix this situation for me and give you the correct document reference. I'm sorry, Commissioner. That document we did tender. It was the document in between that document and the one I've shown you this morning that I just need to find 
the um, doc ID for. I think it's this one. It may be that I've tendered everything I need to tender, Commissioner. If not, I'll come back to that. I'm sorry. Um, that last form of objection handling, um, Mr Martin, that I just asked you about, when a customer says, I want to think about it, um, I'd like to play you an extract from one of the calls provided to ASIC so that we can see how that played out uh, in those calls. Could we please play CVW 5000002-6593? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Instead, it's ASIC 0069-0001-0171A. And could we display on the screen ASIC 0069-0001-0248E? Can, I get the, can you send me this, uh, all of these details to my Yeah, place? look, the, the good thing about it is that we can provide the cover for you immediately. And like most people, like yourself, want to read through everything. Um, so we've got most of your details here. We just confirm it with you. We set it up for you. We give you a policy number. We don't deduct premiums straight away. And all your policy documents will be sent to you within seven working days. Look that way. You're covered and you can read through everything and make sure you're 100% happy. If anything wants to happen the minute you hang up the phone, even before you've paid any premiums, you will be able to make a claim. Okay. okay. Now, All right. I, just, I just need to confirm some details with you, though. I just need your permission to do that. Um, would you like to proceed with the application for the policy, yes or no? Now, we heard there, Mr Martin, an example of a customer who asked to have the details of the policy sent to him before making the decision to purchase. Yes. And we saw your training in action because we saw the Clearview sales agent proceed by insisting on signing up the customer and indicating that the documentation could be sent out later. Yes. Uh, I'll tender that recording and transcript, Commissioner. Recording of sales call, ASIC. 0069-0001-0171-A, Exhibit 6.56, and the transcript of the sales call, Exhibit 6.56, which is ASIC 0069-0001-0248-E, is Exhibit 6.57. Commissioner, Ms Zelesnikov has confirmed for me that I tendered each of the documents that I referred to yesterday. I apologise for the confusion. Uh, now, Mr Martin, these techniques that we've seen, uh, these objection handling techniques this morning and in the documents that I took you to yesterday, were all directed towards having people sign up to their policies, the Clearview policies, immediately, weren't they? Um, yes, they were. And why was it so important to Clearview to sign people up immediately? It, it wasn't important to Clearview. I, and I've said before, I don't agree with those techniques. Um, but they were, as you said, they were the techniques that were being used on the sales floor. Was and it they be seemed to be promoted within Clearview Direct. Yes. 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 Um, were Clearview sales agents trained in this way to sign people up immediately because Clearview was worried that if it gave people time to understand the products they were purchasing, they may not <laughs> choose to purchase them? It seems to be that was the training that was given to them, yes. Or they might realise that they had no need for this sort of product. I, again, I agree. Um, I, as I was trying to explain yesterday, for Clearview uh, as a policy, as an insurer, um, having customers who sign up for contracts they don't want for very long is was not in our interest. So this this was was poor for the customer, mm. terrible for the customer, and, and of no economic value for Clearview either. So it was silly. Well, it resulted in a lot of customers signing up for and paying for products that they didn't need or want, didn't it? Yes, it did. Mm. Uh, Clearview didn't want to give people time to reflect before making the purchase, did they? No, the direct business didn't. Um, or the opportunity to be influenced in that purchasing decision by someone else like their partner or a friend? No, that's correct. Okay. 
and the purpose of this objection handling system was to ultimately wear down the customer to the point where um, they no longer viewed their objection as a point worth continuing to raise. Yeah, either wear them down or sidestep them, yes. Wear them down or sidestep them? Yeah, I'm just I'm agreeing with you. 100%. Yes, yes. So the overarching theme that we see both from the scripts that I took you to yesterday as to how the sales agents were to conduct the calls and from the objection handling training that I took you to yesterday and this morning um, is a sell at all costs approach and that was reflective of Clearview Direct's broader culture. Do you accept that? I would accept that. That mm. seems to be the case, yes. And another way we saw that, we see that culture having played out within Clearview was uh, random incentive days that Clearview held. Do you know anything about those? I've seen some material since, yes. There were days every now and then when Clearview staff were encouraged to sell frenetically, weren't there? It would appear that they were. That All was right. The case. Could I show you CVW 5000 This is an email chain. Uh, from September 2015. And could we have um, both the first and second page of that email on the screen? We see there at 3278, team, I'm putting a random incentive day. I want this joint pumping with belling, clapping and sales. Let it rain gift cards. You see that? Um, yes, I've seen that. And just above, guys, we are chasing your premiums targets today in capital letters. Yes. And above that, on the previous page, first sale for the day gets a ticket. Who will the first ticket go to? Yes, I see that. So this is an example of one of the incentive days that Clearview had to incentivise its sales agents to sell lots of policies? Um, yes. Tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, emails re-incentive day, let's rip it up. 9 September 15, CBW 5000, 0013277, Exhibit 6.58. And I, can I take you to another incentive campaign in late 2016? Uh, where Clearview decided that an injection was required to stimulate the team and revive the cultural pulse. Can I take you to CVW 5000-0049765? And could I ask you to look at the second page of that document, 9766, under the heading recommendation you see the sentence that I just read out. We believe an injection is required to stimulate the team and revive the cultural pulse. And a reference there to rebuilding momentum and running a strategic sales incentive. It would run over a five month period, November to March, open to sales consultants only. Rather than qualifying by achieving agreed performance hurdles, we'll take the top third of the sales team to drive the bar higher and other two places will be reserved at my discretion to recognise business contribution, leadership behaviour's greatest improvement. Our event company has first right of refusal on a special deal to Queenstown. So that's what the prize for this one was, uh, a travel package to Queenstown. And if we um, pan back a bit, we'll see that in the prize was travel, accommodation and entertainment in this trip to Queenstown. Do you see that? Um, yes, I do. And do you see also uh, the paragraph, three paragraphs in under the heading estimated costs? Whilst aware of the optics around direct position to budget, this is not a junket or a celebration. It's a considered investment into the build out of a direct business model for Clearview 
In fact, strategic programs such as this should be seen as a necessary cost of running a direct operation. Costs should probably be allocated as a recruitment rather than an entertainment line item. What do you say to that, Mr Martin? It was just inappropriate activity, in fact. Um, that arrived, I believe, in November 16. Um, as far as I was concerned, that, that whole document, and there's some other issues with that, um, really signalled that we under was when we really started to understand that the culture in that business was not what we thought. What are the other issues you're referring to with this document oh, or this just, campaign? Just the whole language that's in there and the, as, as some of the things you talked about was you know, not only this stuff, but that particular reference here. The next sentence in here is, measuring the return on investment is difficult to quantify. However, we should all be confident with the conceptual notion that the monetary benefits associated with proactively reducing <coughs> turnover are greater than doing nothing, i.e. simply banking the money. Do you understand what that means? Um, no, I actually don't actually understand what yes. that means at all. It, yes. it's, it seemed to be almost... Actually, it read, reads as sales sale spiel to me, as if mm. somebody was trying to sell to senior management um, something that was just wrong, considering at this point we were trying to refocus to the mid-market, address problems <laughs> that had already been raised with the business, and, and this, this, this materialises. Could I ask you to look at the very final sentence on the page, which is not highlighted at the moment? We'll need to pan back. The author of this document, do you know who wrote this document? Yes, I do. Who was it? I believe it was the uh, head of Clearview Direct. The head of Clearview Direct, so the person in charge of running your direct he, sales. He either, he either wrote it or he was the one who sent it on, mm. yes. Uh, so we see that the head of Direct says in the final sentence on this page, which perhaps we could enlarge, we will work with respective departments to reduce tax exposure, FBT implications, and circumvent regulatory barriers, packaged as a training or educational trip in lieu of FOFA conflicted remuneration. That is you one of that? the words in there that you were, I was referring to. This is one of the other issues with this document, is it? Yeah, that was one of the serious issues. Well, yeah. so the head of direct sales within Clearview knew that this was conflicted remuneration, a breach of the FOFA reforms, knew that it would breach regulatory provisions, knew that it was a breach of the law and therefore elected to package it deceptively as a training or educational trip. I, well, I, I, I could actually not tell you whether it was, would be actually a breach of the law, but the very thought that he thought it could be and decided to circumvent was a thing that concerned me. Um, it concerned more, you, did you More say? than concerned me, yes. Uh, when was this document first brought to your attention, Mr Martin? I think it was very, was it mid to late November? Mid to late November, which year? 16, is that right? Yes, well, this is a document from um, November 16, as we understand it. Um, uh, the final quarter of 2016 is all that we are able... It's an undated document, but the content makes clear that it's from the final quarter of 2016. You say it was brought to your attention in November 2016. What action did you take when it was brought to your attention? Um. I don't actually recall, but I've, I have seen emails uh, involving this, and there's no response from me other than I suspect I well, I don't actually know that I read all the way to the bottom either at the time, um, but I'm sure I went and visited the MD and the CFO and said over my dead body, or well, words to that effect. You visited the managing director and the CEO and said words to the effect and, of and, and over reaction, my dead body, and the reaction from them was the same. They went, I've got no. So did this incentive campaign proceed? No. And what action was taken against uh, the head of direct sales at Clearview in connection with this campaign that he was orchestrating? Um, there was nothing taken at the time, but this was one of the, one of the matters that precipitated review of the whole business in then January and the plan to close it and terminate 
but was were there any consequences for the head of direct sales at Clearview um, for intending to circumvent regulatory barriers by packaging this sales incentive scheme as an educational trip? Um, no, there were not. Why not, Mr Martin? I, I, we were probably just focused on chatting to business. And as I said to you before, I'm not sure when I actually saw this originally that I read all the way through. I only got to a sales camp, I've got an incentive program for Queenstown, which was just inappropriate at the time. Do you think the managing director or the CEO whose attention you drew to this document... CFO. I'm sorry, the CFO whose attention you drew this document to read all the way through? I, I don't... I actually don't know and they could well have reacted similar to me that it was at the time um, just, you know, we weren't going to do that. It wasn't just wasn't going to happen. But none of you took any steps uh, to discipline or otherwise sanction the head of your direct sales for his clear intention to breach the law? I, well, as I said, I, I, I actually don't know what, what, what may have discu been discussed between the MD and the, and the head of direct, um, but I, as far as I'm aware, we, we didn't take any action. Was that a satisfactory response? <coughs> uh, not in retrospect, no. A few weeks ago, uh, your Chief Executive Officer, Mr Simon Swanson, uh, gave an interview to The Australian. Have you read the press clipping about that? That's Ms. the one you sent through uh, recently, yes. And he said in that article that Clearview has a strong, positive culture that champions the client and strives for continuous improvement. Did you see that in the article in The Australian, the yes, quote from Mr Swanson. And are the matters that we see in this document representative of that sort of culture, Mr Martin? Um, no, this document is not representative of that culture at all. It's the antithesis of that sort of culture, isn't it, Mr Martin? It is indeed. I tender this document, Commissioner. Strategic Sales Incentive Proposal 2016, CBW 5000-0049765, Exhibit 6.59. Now, I want to move, Mr Martin, to asking you some questions about the third and final issue that I identified yesterday as contributing to the systemic compliance issues at Clearview. And that third issue that I identified yesterday was uh, ineffective compliance systems. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, now, the quality assurance methodology that was used for the direct sales business was flawed, wasn't it? Um, as we know now, yes. Yes. In what way was it flawed? Um, in particular, it, it wasn't um, measuring or identifying, uh, in particular, pressure selling or some of the techniques we discussed a little while ago on some of those phone calls. So your quality assurance team were not picking up uh, the sorts of conduct that we've discussed yesterday in the sales calls? Um, that's correct. Uh, uh, we know from yesterday that the focus of the quality assurance team's work was on flagged agents rather than standard agents. That's correct. Those flagged agents being the new agents and agents who'd already been identified as having compliance breaches? That's correct and internal documents show us that uh, Clearview was aware uh, that agents who knew that they had not been flagged uh, felt some sort of immunity and were more relaxed and complacent with compliance requirements as a result. Have you seen those documents, Mr Martin? I have become aware of those, yes. Uh, whereas the agents who knew that they were flagged uh, tended to become more disciplined because they knew their calls were being scrutinised. Um, that's correct. And once Clearview became aware of that, did it take any steps to address that, to change the system about which calls it was monitoring? Um, I, I can't remember when we became aware of that. Um, if that was around the middle of 2016, um, one of the strategies at that time was to actually move to 100% review of all calls um, and implement a 100% QA process at that time. In the middle of 2016, you say? Well, the around um, August, September 16, um, after we had the problem with the the 42 calls that went to ASIC, 
and then we had the um, we did our separate review and by the end of August we realized that there were some some issues uh, we still weren't clear at that stage exactly the extent of those issues um, but to my mind um, I started discussing them with the head of direct to move to a, a system which was just 100% review of all phone calls that were sales um, and move to a, a, a methodology of faster remediation if there was any issues um, and that was being investigated from that point forward. And did you ever get to the point where you were reviewing 100% of sales calls? Um, I don't believe we got to the point of implementing the contract with the party to do that. We okay. weren't going to do it internally. Um, and that we had the Queensland to town email by that stage and we were moving in January then to shut the business down. I see. So you made a decision to move towards a model of monitoring 100% of sales calls, but you never ended up executing that decision? No, we decided to quit the business before mm, that. I see. Um, can I show you a document that is an assessment of the direct sales business from early February 2017? Uh, CVW 8000000511. You seen this document before, yes. Mr. Martin? Uh, now. Clearview's assessment of its direct business as um, contained in this document from February 2017 included a number of very damning findings, didn't it? Uh, yes, it did. Including about your quality assurance processes. Uh, yes, it did. And one of the issues that we see raised in this document is that there was an insufficient division between the sales team and the quality assurance function. Yes. If we uh, look at the second page of this document, 0512, we see next to the word structure. Do you see four rows down the page structure? The head of contact centre delivery is responsible for both sales, operations and compliance and quality assurance. This is a conflict as sales are prioritised ahead of compliance and operations. Yes. And had Clearview always structured its direct business in that way? Um, uh, my understanding is that's the way the Clearview direct business was structured, mm. yes. So that had been the model for a number of years? As I understand it, yes. And is this one of the things that you were referring to in your statement when uh, you said that Clearview's quality assurance staff were not sufficiently independent of the underlying business? Yes. Uh, were you also referring to the fact that the Your Insure quality assurance team was in-house? Um, I wasn't referring to that, but yes. Are you aware that they were? Um, yes. Are you aware that they were moved in-house with the sales team to allow Your Insure to focus on client acquisition? Um, I think I may have heard that reference, yes. Now, after ASIC became involved in 2017, Clearview decided to separate its compliance staff from its sales staff, is that right? So when was that, after? After ASIC became involved in 2017, yes. was there a decision made to yes. separate your compliance staff from your sales staff? Um, was a decision made to move the compliance staff to head office so that they couldn't, in the words of Clearview internal documents, be personally influenced by the call centre staff? It was to, um, yes, do that and also make sure that we were happy internally within head office, that the QA was actually doing what it was supposed to do. Why wasn't the quality assurance team separated and independent from the sales team from the start? Um, on reflection, it, it should have been. It just we just didn't, we just made a mistake well, with it. Clearview never prioritised compliance, did it? I... No, the, the direct team did not com prioritise compliance, no. And that was reflected in the decision to put the quality assurance team, who were meant to be monitoring the sales team, in with the sales team? Yeah. We see also in this document, on this same page, 512, um, 
that there are suggestions that the quality assurance team wasn't sufficiently well resourced to allow a searching quality assurance process for calls other than sales calls. Do you see that reference? Uh, we're, yeah, oh, yes. You know that that's the case? Um, that was an expression of, a, of the person who wrote this opinion. But do, yes. do you agree that there was a lack of resourcing for the quality assurance function? I'm not sure that I would entirely agree it was a lack of resourcing, but it could have been better resourced. Um, and more importantly, the, 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 to my mind, the bigger issue in all of this was the QA wasn't focused on the right things rather than necessarily... What, what were they focused on, Mr Martin? Well, as we refer, what I was referring before, they weren't focused on the pressure selling aspects. So what, what were they looking for? Uh, they what were looking for, in re, as I understand it, in retrospect, lots of things around... Um, personal advice, other mis, you know, misdescription of products, other breaches, but the, the thing they weren't um, focused on is some of the subtle points that we've been talking about over the last few hours around the um, selling on free look periods and some of that things that, that the, you were... The subtle points, did you say? Well, I don't mean subtle points, but I meant those, those, those points, yeah. So you said they weren't focused on pressure selling. Mm. That, that's not a subtle no, thing to I, pick sorry, up, is it? No, I don't mean it that way. But yes, yes they weren't. They, it was those particular points, those sales techniques, they weren't focused on. Well, they weren't measuring and they weren't reporting on. Right. Um, so there was a problem with what they were doing and there was a problem with which calls uh, they were doing anything to in the first place, wasn't there? Well, I think focusing on actual sales calls was, was reasonable. Um, as you said, we discovered later on that unfortunately the agents started to game that. I, mm. I would have said if we had a, just a, a normal conversation and you said you were going to flag or put more effort onto new agents or agents who had caused breach before, I don't think anybody would think that was an unreasonable thing, um, not understanding that the agents would then um, you know, behave in response to that was, was a, another matter. Yeah. There was also a problem with the quality assurance and compliance team lacking the necessary expertise in relation to direct sales, wasn't there? Um, I believe that that may have been the case as well. Do yes. you see from the row-headed um, direct experience in this document? There appears to be a lack of direct experts at Clearview. In particular, there is a lack of end-to-end -end direct specific legal and compliance experience, particularly in the direct business. Yes. You see that? Yes. There is a quality t assurance team of four and no resource with legal or compliance experience or knowledge in the direct business. Yes. While the group legal and compliance resources do not have deep direct business experience, the language of the scripts suggests that there may also not be expertise in script writing. Um, yes, I see that. What was their expertise in, Mr. Martin? This was this document here is is an assessment, as you said in in February, and I actually asked for it to be produced um, about what was what the truth of the matter of direct was. The intention was that we had employed experienced people in direct to run a direct business. This was the assessment that we got to that, in fact, um, in a totality, they actually hadn't. Um, didn't, didn't have the people and the skills to do the job properly. Mm. And we see next to QA process in this document um, that there were concerns about the quality, of quali the quality of quality assurance performed as there have been differences between quality assurance results when legal and group compliance have reviewed them. And that was what we saw yesterday, wasn't yes. it, with the 42 calls? Uh, and is that what you've described in your statement as Clearview's quality assurance staff not being suitably qualified, these sorts of matters that we see in this document? They, they lacked both um, qualifications, but more importantly, the direction they were given was poor. Yes. Yes. So they lacked qualifications, they lacked experience, they lacked supervision and they lacked resources. Yes. The quality assurance function at Clearview was hardly a quality assurance function, was it, Mr Martin? No, it was weak. 
uh, and you tell us in your statement that the staff who were responsible for overseeing compliance of the relevant business were not sufficiently experienced in outbound direct life sales, despite many having sound life insurance backgrounds. So yeah. is that what they came from? Was there background in the selling of life insurance? No, I think that, that was meant to be a, a reference to people outside the um, um, Clearview Direct team. So that was within the legal team and the head office compliance team. While they all had deep life insurance experience, most, most of the team outside Clearview Direct did not have deep uh, direct experience to identify some of these issues. And there were issues with the escalation the reporting of quality assurance issues we see from this page as well, don't we? Yes, Under the I... heading reporting and governance at the bottom of the page, inaccurate quality assurance data has been provided. This is possibly due to a number of reasons, stretched resources, little attention to detail and manual nature of quality assurance process. The level of detail provided to the Direct Risk and Compliance Committee is insufficient to form an accurate view on the state of compliance. Yes, that's what we had come to form the view of at that stage. And so, I think we saw an email yesterday around some scripts that also is relevant. So this document, which was created at your request, revealed that it was not possible to say what the level of compliance was within the direct sales business. Um, correct. Uh, stage, yes. And can we just go back to the previous page, 0511, because I just want to ask you as well about the portion described as executive skills gaps. The general manager of direct has experience and skills in direct sales, operations and marketing, but less experience and skills in the financial management of a direct business and generally has potential gaps in the areas of regulation and compliance. Yes. By this point, you knew that there were more potential gaps with his conduct, didn't you? You'd seen the Queenstown incentive campaign and how he wanted to dress that up to circumvent regulatory barriers. Um, yes, I'm not sure that the person who drafted this note necessarily had seen that, but anyway, yes. All right. So do you accept overall, uh, Mr Martin, that there were very significant deficiencies in Clearview's compliance programs and processes that were a significant contributor to the compliance outcomes that we saw in the 42 calls and which you acknowledged yesterday were endemic beyond those 42 calls? Um, yes, they were significant beyond those calls, yes. <clears throat> All right, I tender this document, Commissioner. A Clearview Assessment Direct Business uh, Draft February 17, CBW 8000 Exhibit 6.60. Now, Mr Martin, in September last year, a few months after Clearview ceased its direct sales business, ASIC and Clearview negotiated terms by which ASIC's investigation into Clearview's contraventions of both the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act would be resolved. Yes. You were part of those negotiations? Um, yes. All right. Uh, can I ask you to look at Exhibit 54 to your statement, CVW 6000-0055? You've seen this letter before, Mr Martin? Um, yes, I've seen it before. Um, this is the proposal that ASIC sent to Clearview to uh, resolve its investigation on the 19th of September last year? Yes, that's correct. Uh, now, on this first page, we can see that ASIC referred to the concerns that it held about potential contraventions of the anti-hawking provisions contraventions of the general obligations of financial services licensees imposed by the Corporations Act and contraventions of the consumer protection provisions of the ASIC Act. Yes, I see that. And we see that under the heading ASIC's response, that ASIC was willing to resolve this matter on the condition the licensee agrees to undertake the following. And if we could turn to the next page.
there were eight conditions imposed by ASIC which involved Clearview engaging Ernst & Young to do a piece of work and to implement recommendations that came from that piece of work, to implement and finalise a consumer remediation program, to prioritise your resources to that remediation program and undertake it in a timely manner, to provide ASIC with copies of scripting and correspondence referencing the remediation program, to ensure that all communication with consumers about the remediation program is behaviourally informed and in terms approved by ASIC, to confirm remediation details as soon as possible, and if at any point in the future the licensee intends to recommence offering life insurance policies to retail customers through the direct or non-advised channel, to advise ASIC before doing so. These were the eight conditions imposed by ASIC to resolve these breaches. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, now, Clearview agreed to those terms. Yes. And we see in this letter that um, ASIC told you that a media release would be published in relation to the matter and that Clearview would be given an opportunity prior to the media release to tell ASIC if it had concerns regarding any factual inaccuracies? Um, yes. Now, um, you agreed to the terms and then there was um, subsequent discussion about the boundaries of the remediation program, is that right? Um, yes, I think that's correct, yes. And the remediation program extends to 32,068 policies sold by Clearview over a three and a half year period um, from the start of 2014 to the middle of 2017? That's correct. And uh, how were those 32,000 odd policies identified? Um, essentially, they're, um, all, the, all the policies that were sold that we could identify, um, sorry, let me rephrase that, all the policies essentially that were sold um, via Clearview Direct over that period, um, only excluding a few, few um, policies that we could clearly identify weren't outbound telemarketing, which in fact was very few. It was essentially, essentially all of them. So Clearview accepted that the policies sold over that period, excluding the small number that weren't on outbound sales that you've mentioned, um, included calls that uh, uh, showed pressure selling tactics being used uh, and misdescriptions of the policy terms being used and other levels of unfair sales practices that we've discussed uh, this morning and yesterday. Yes, the 32,000 includes all sales, whether or not they had those features, but obviously within there we, we, we believe there, or we know, there were significant issue, um, numbers of all those events, yes. You tell us in your statement that there are three categories of people within the remediation program, but all up the remediation program encompasses about 26,000 people, is that right? Um, there is, uh, we, there's one, uh, one group at the moment, there's 6,000 uh, uh, customers we're just uh, in discussion with ASIC about out of the 32, uh, that at this stage, while they were classified as um, sales, they were in fact policies that never completed um, and never paid a dollar, and as far as we can tell, never incurred um, any any costs at all. So we're just with ASIC now, just talking about what what remediation we actually do for those. But but that's 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 the difference between the 26 and the 32. So how many customers do you presently estimate will be covered by the remediation program? Well, we've already mailed the 26,000. We've already paid out. Um, we've, all, we've sent uh, uh, compensation uh, amounts to um, five, three, nearly 10,000 at this stage. Um, and I think 60% of those people actually have the money in their hands. Uh, the others, we have to get bank account details or something to actually physically give them the money. Um, I, one of the unfortunate things is if you pay your bills by um, credit card, and the credit card expires, it's quite hard to give the money back to a credit card. So we're just trying, we, we have a process at the moment to uh, get bank accounts to actually get the money in those customer hands. And that's 
when I was referring re uh, yesterday to about two months from here, we expect to hopefully have the program finished. It'll be and not everyone is getting a full refund of their premiums, is that right? Uh, no. And how have you identified who gets a full refund and who doesn't? Um, well, we worked with ASIC. We did some very um, detailed analysis across the book. Um, basically, the conclusion was um, anybody who kept their policy for less than three months or um, people in, um, in, in, in the Indigenous postcodes who we thought would, would include vulnerable people, we extended that to five months. So they've been given all, all their premiums back as clearly people who um, displayed by, you know, by dint of that short ownership that they were um, um, you know, unwanting of the contract and, and likely that that would have included the vast majority of people who were subject to pressure selling and those three, you know, free, free look period selling and all the rest of it. Um, the other end of the spectrum, there's obviously something like 9,000 policies that are still in force at the moment and people have had those policies for a number of years. Um, they clearly have rights under those contracts um, and so, at the moment, they're the ones who we've mailed to say, um, if you have any concerns about the way you were sold, um, please contact us and we'll re review your call. And, you know, subject to that, if there's, um, you know, there's pressure selling where we have a, a process at the moment to, to provide compensation, but it's not a, it's not a, um, all premiums are refunded because that would mean a cancel of the contract, which it, they obviously what, have what, why does it mean that? Why can't you refund the premiums and keep the policies on foot? Refund them to, to where? Refund the, well, refund the premiums to the people that you think may have um, been sold the policy in circumstances where there were pressure sales tactics. Premiums could be paid going forward, but why can't you refund some of the premiums that have been paid? Now, Well, th that could be a methodology that was not what we've agreed with ASIC. As I said, we've agreed a, a, an amount of compensation, but it was, there's also just a question of, we've tried to be fair and equitable on this as well. So if somebody's had their policy for five years and somebody's had two years, why do you give somebody two years and keep it and somebody gets five? And what happens if somebody comes back in 10 years' time and say, oh, I think I was precious old 10 years ago, do they get all their money back for 10? It's just trying to balance those issues out, mm -hmm. that's all. That's all. Uh, so there is a category of customers who are encompassed by the remediation program who have to opt in to receive remediation. They yes. have to respond to your letter and explain why they feel that... No, they don't have to explain anything. What they, do they have to explain? All they need to ask is um, for their case to be reviewed and we will review it, make a decision, and if we have any concerns about it, including if there's any um, you know, misdescription of products or anything else in there, we'll, we'll remediate it all. So by your engagement with ASIC and your development, uh, development of this remediation program, does Clearview accept that in the um, pressure sales that it made between 2013 and 2016, its representatives breached the prohibition on unconscionable conduct on occasion? Yes. And that they breached the prohibition on misleading or deceptive conduct? Yes. Uh, and that they breached Clearview's duty of utmost good faith to its policyholders? Unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. And does Clearview accept more broadly that its processes for pressuring customers to sign up to policies immediately and its processes for aggressive objection handling were unfair to its customers and led to customer detriment? Yes, we do. And as a result of those contraventions and those unfair processes, does Clearview accept that it contravened its obligation to do all things uh, necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by its AFSL uh, were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly? Um, yes, we, we didn't do enough. Didn't do enough? Yes, we breached it, yes. You breached 9121A of the Corporations Act? I believe so, yes. Uh, and you failed to ensure that your representatives were adequately trained? Um, yes. And you failed to take reasonable steps to ensure that your representatives complied with the financial services laws? Um, yes. And does Clearview accept that the remuneration and incentive structures that it had in place um, 
encouraged sales agents to make as many sales as possible, sometimes at the expense of the customer's best interests. Um, they would have had that effect, yes. And in that regard, there was a failure to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of the conflict that Clearview created between the interests of its employees and the interests of its customers. Uh, that's, that's the nub of the issue, is the lack of control, that's right. Now, uh, as part of your resolution with ASIC, um, you've agreed to tell ASIC if at any point in the future you intend to recommence selling through the direct channel. Yes. Does Clearview presently have any intention to do that? Um, no. Uh, can you imagine a situation in which that would occur? If direct means things like online or something like that, maybe. If it means outbound telephone, no. In your view, is it possible to sell life insurance in outbound sales calls in a way that is both financially viable and legally compliant? In retrospect, I find it difficult to understand how you can reconcile those things. I, I, it is possible. It, it, it's, it would be possible to make it legally compliant. My difficulty personally with it is I, I just don't understand how a customer in a phone call that lasts 20 minutes can come to a view of, of a, um, um, you know, understanding exactly what they've bought in a fairly complex sort of area of, of financial services. I, I personally just think it's, it's problematic. Um, there'd be the possibility of in, inbound calls. So if somebody had researched it, understood what they wanted, and then rang in to buy a product, that's one thing. But an outbound uh, arrangement, I find just, just difficult. Now, I want to ask you, apart from this negotiated resolution um, of the contraventions with ASIC, what action has ASIC taken against Clearview in relation to the 300 to 303,000 criminal offences that were comprised of the breaches of the anti-hawking provisions? Um, we've not had further discussions at this stage with ASIC on that. Do you understand that ASIC will be taking any action against Clearview? Um, we have. I, I don't know. Um, do you understand from this letter that ASIC regards its investigation as having been resolved? Um, that's what the letter said, but I'm, I, I would always be open. I would have, well, this investigation's resolved. I'm not sure what, what, whether that meant that they closed the case completely on this. So I, I'm Has ASIC indicated to you that it will recommend pursuing a criminal prosecution of Clearview for those 300 to 303,000 criminal offences? Um, no, I have heard nothing to that effect. Has ASIC indicated to you that it will take any action against Clearview in relation to the unconscionable conduct? Um, no. Has ASIC indicated to you that it will take any action in relation to the misleading or deceptive conduct? Um, no. Uh, has ASIC indicated that it will take any action against Clearview in relation to its licence because of any breach of section 912.1a of the Corporations Act? Um, no, it hasn't. Do you understand that ASIC intends to take any further action against Clearview? At this stage, I don't understand they were doing anything further, no. Okay. Thank you, Mr Martin. I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms Orr. Yes, Mr Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, just, um, I don't have questions for Mr Martin. The two issues of documents, if I may, have discussed both of these with Ms Orr. Um, the first one is that Ms Orr yesterday asked Mr Martin questions about a document correspondence with ASIC in March 2017, which referred to two uh, letters in February of 2017 from Clearview. One of those was in evidence, being the letter of 3 January. The letter of 10 January is not in evidence. Um, I have a copy of it. It's on the system, um, and I seek to tender that document. What's the doc ID? Uh, CVW 7002-005-1482. will become exhibit 6.61, letter... Uh, Letter from Clearview to ASIC, 10 February 2017. Yes. Uh, and the other matter is, Ms Orr yesterday questioned Mr Martin about um, documents that had not been exhibited to his witness statement, in particular some correspondence with ASIC. 
uh, at transcript 5335 and 5336, um, Ms Orr also stated that the Commission had obtained those documents from ASIC. Um, I want to make clear that by, that by the time of the relevant witness statement from Mr Martin, Clearview had in fact already produced in response to notices to produce from the Commission versions of all of its correspondence with ASIC including all of the documents to which Ms. Orr took Mr. Martin yesterday. Commissioner, those were all the only matters I wished to address. Thank you very much. Yes, yes uh, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, perhaps if we could have a brief break before the next case study, which involves a different entity. If I come back at uh, 10 to 11. Thank you, Commissioner.